Welcome to Fat Man on Batman. I'm Kevin Smith. Uh, okay, we're going to take a detour uh, from the Dark Knight to the Man of Steel. That's right, this edition of Fat Man on Batman. We're not going to talk much about Batman. Um, or, well, one of us won't. I bet you <laughs> the other one is going to long for the days of of previous Batmans <sighs> and whatnot. Capes, darkened capes. Oh, and dear Lord. Th- such forth. Uh, this week on Fat Man on Batman, a very special guest so we can make it. Fat Man and Gar Man. Oh, see on what you Superman. Did. I like it. It's a three way. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my my good buddy and, and co host, the, the host, I'm actually the co host, the host of Hollywood Babylon, um, uh, uh, podcasting's Frank Garman. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> That's an old Keith joke. for having me here. That goes way the fuck back to the. <laughs> it does. You got to be an old school Babylon <laughs> fan to get that joke. Ralph Garman, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, sir. Um, it, it's uh, this podcast is breaking on Monday morning, so in the real world, you're on K Rock. That's right. Yes, and, and I always want to point that out for folks who are like, we fucking love Ralph more. Ralph, I'm like, you can get five times the amount of Ralph that we dole out per week if they just go to the Kevin and Bean podcast. Do they podcast the entire show? No, they do an edited down version. They take you know, it's four four hours of live radio in the morning, so they usually distill it down to about an hour, hour and a half. And I got to imagine you're involved in most of it. They throw in a lot of the skits that I do, the voice bits, and then they usually take one showbiz beat which for people who listen to Babylon will recognize sort of as a very similar uh, format. That's to, where it was. It was the birth of Babylon. Yeah. Uh, you know. They throw in one of those. They pick one of those a, a day to put in. But I do it five times a, a morning on the show. So That's true. If you ever listen to K-Rock, you hear Ralph do the same stories like five times a row and find a different way to make them fresh. Because yeah. hour by hour, you got to assume the same people listening at 7 weren't listening at 8 o'clock. Yeah. It's the beauty of the podcast. You get to do it once. Exactly. And not like Save all your best times. for one shot. So, um, Ralph, uh, is, uh, normally over there at K rock today. He's over here at fat man on Batman to talk about the man of steel. Ralph is a superhero enthusiast. Yes. Quite like myself. Um, also I should shout out, man, like Babylon's been down for two weeks. We're coming back this week. Yep. Um, we'll have a show on Friday at our new home at the improv. So it'll be up next Monday morning for y'all, but this will take the place of a Babylon. Yeah, this It'll is Babylon esque. Fat, fat man on Fatman on Batman. <laughs> Fatman. Um, and a bit of uh, Babylon as well. So uh, you get a twofer out of this. And it's going to be chunky. Ugh. I would imagine. Don't <laughs> get me started. <laughs> I guess you have to get me started, don't you? Um, the uh, I, I sense it already. Met of Steel <laughs> coming from Ralph. <laughs> Look, I won't bury the lead. I like the movie a lot. Go ahead. Don't I did lead. not. Oh, my Lord. We're going to have a regular old fat and skinny Cisco and Ebert <laughs> battle on our hands. I did not like it a lot. Thumbs up and a thumbs down, if you will, a fat and skinny. Um, okay, so before we dive into that, and a lot of people have asked, do it like you did The Dark Knight Returns. I did these two podcasts like where I... Went over those. I, that's never going to happen. I saw those that that movie four times that weekend. Uh, you know, Batman is my fucking favorite character on the planet. Right. So I could I could cry and go into operatic fucking tantrums about how beautiful that movie was, even though that had plot holes and shit like that. And then yeah. me and Ralph sat down on Fat Man and Batman, and he took all the steam out of my previous fucking. I love this movie. As he really brought it down to earth and, and made you think about it, it. <laughs> there's a little bit of that. Yeah, he was like, "Why don't you take, why don't you take that crying towel away from your eyes? Look at the screen. Put down your joint. <laughs> and look at what's happening there up there." There was that as well. Um, so this will be not not nearly the same thing, but both oh, of it's us going to be close. <laughs> <laughs> both of us will be, uh, you know, uh, we're coming from the same perspective. Long time superhero enthusiast. How far you go back with the Superman character? Uh, George Reeves watching on TV. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, for those who are like George Reeves, it was Christopher Reeves. No, before Christopher Reeves, there was black and white Superman. Was right. that a TV? That was a TV show. 1952. Right? Love it. This is what we got, Ralph. The Adventures of Superman uh, hit the airwaves, was syndicated, and then eventually they went to color. They, I think in 54 or 55, they started doing color episodes. But Prior to that, had it been s- serials? Had there been Superman Kirk serials? Allen starred in the uh, the Superman serials in the 40s. So you're talking about 50s. little cliffhangers that would play before the main feature or four kids as they grouped them together. Right. A serialized film where they would show you like a 15-minute episode each Saturday morning at your local movie theater. You'd go to see that. Take us even and further then, back. Uh, Fleischer, uh, the uh, Fleischer uh, animation also did an animated version mm-hmm. of Superman, which is still 
acclaimed was, as like one of the great the interpretations. Launching point for Bruce Tim, um, the Batman, the animated series. Right. They, they, they borrowed heavily from it, particularly in their opening, the opening non credit sequence. Like if the opening of the Batman animated series, that little vignette about bank robbers and blimps in the air and the Batman, and when they go in close on it looks like the Fleischer. Superman. Yeah. It was the most dramatic. And, and it was also like way ahead of its time. It was like, you know, did you ever see that movie, uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy? Like they find a bottle of glass Coke bottle. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God. This cartoon is, was so completely out of time, so ahead of its time and so beautiful. Not only does it look classic, it looks modern it at does. the same time. Um, and then the radio serial also too, of course, for Bud Collier starred on the uh, Superman on the radio. What did that 40s. sound like? He was great because Bud Collier actually was also the voice of Clark Kent and Superman in the filmation um, Adventures of Superman Get in, out in of the here. 60s, in the mid-60s. Yeah, they brought him back. And he was great because he was the guy who invented the difference in voice between, gee, Lois, I think we should go rescue Jimmy, too. This looks like a job for Superman. I mean, he did it all with his voice on the radio. So he sort of created that dichotomy between the, the milk toast Clark Kent character and then the Superman, you know, heroic voice. Thing. He was so the first. He invented that transition, you know. So so going even further the back, to watch, watch the geek creds here. The uh, origin of Superman dates to Action Comics number one. Right. What year is this? 39. Um, it's created by, this is what never gets heralded, man. It's an international effort, a bridge between two nations, Ralph. A little American kid and a little Canadian kid. Yeah. I mean, they were, you know, in their 20s, or I think, or something like late teens, early 20s when they started. But two kids, uh, Siegel and Schuster, got together and, and created the idea of the Superman. One of them together, the first incarnation of the Superman, he was far more villainous, wanted to control the world. And, right. And then the other guy came in and said, hey, let's soften him up. I, I'm imagining it was probably the Canadian influence sure. <laughs> that made him less of, I want to conquer the world. Um, let's make him nice, eh? Where he like saves people and helps people, eh? Wouldn't it be better if he was kind to everyone? What if he helped people instead of like trying to take over the world, eh? Who will be his villain if he is a villain? <laughs> <laughs> You've written us into a corner, eh? Two so, Jewish kids in Cleveland, Ohio is where it all happened. That's where it was, yeah. right? And so they put together this billion dollar idea. That they um, sold for 200 bucks to DC. <laughs> to DC Comics. And they've just, that's been proven now in a court of law. They were, family's been fighting that for a long time, but it's all been cleared up. The, uh, the character has endured for 75 years now. This year represents the 75th birthday of uh, Superman, the right. Man of Steel. So n no more fitting way to honor the birthday than to have a movie at the ready. Not only a movie. This Here's how important this fucking movie is, okay? It's not just, hey, man, here's another Superman movie. M M Warner Brothers needs to start their, kickstart their Marvel-type universe. Universe. Right. Uh, cinematic universe. Just like the Marvel characters, which DC has bought Marvel films, and now Disney, I'm mean, not DC, Disney, and now Disney owns Marvel. They have a plethora of characters to choose from, uh, an entire universe, so many licenses, so many potential movies mm -hmm. just sitting there. Think about the movie business. Let's break it down this way. In the movie business, you sit around and go like, we need to make tentpole movies to sell tickets. You, what's your idea for a script? We'll buy that script off of you. You, let's put these things together and hopefully they'll work. A story's about doctors and lawyers and people who care about other people. <laughs> that That's, you know, you want, when you're running a studio, you want the safest bet possible. Yes. And when you have a proven formula out there, which is like, you know, people like to go to the movies to see good guys fight bad guys. Dates all the way back to the beginning of cinema. Uh, the, the, in terms of genres, the entire Western genre is pretty much about that. Yep. This is the modern day Western, the superhero action movie. And to have, for a studio to have a treasure trove of all these characters in the DC universe that, that they could literally shut down production of every other type of movie and just solely make superhero movies and never have to spend another dime on an original idea because they own all these characters and all these conceits and they could pull from every comic book story ever made. And these characters already have goodwill towards them because they've been around for decades. Fan bases that will name follow them everywhere. And, oh, it's, it is. It's a treasure trove of cash waiting to happen. And we've seen it happen once before. So much so that Disney 
said, I want to buy Marvel. We need this. There's such smart business operator. We buy this. We got little boys covered from now until the end of time. Yep. And Marvel had figured out the universe. They, uh, John Favreau was hired to direct Iron Man. And because of John Favreau going, I want Robert Downey Jr., the entire spine of and brain of the Marvel universe in the next six, seven, eight years of, uh, of prosperity hangs on that one Iron Man movie, it's treating it seriously. Um, but it, having some joy in it. Very important. I knew that was coming. Yeah. Some, some, some fun also injected Absolutely. into you, that. You can't not have fun. As Richard Donner too. would say, you take the material seriously, but you don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, that would be the, the equation for a perfect superhero movie. Sounds like a review before a review. <laughs> <laughs> We're still on the business aspect of it, Ralph. Stop stabbing it already, man. You can't bring the man of steel down, dude. Um, this is uh, th- this is this represents a financial windfall for Warner Brothers. Um, makes the, it figures out their next ten years, maybe. Yeah. Um, and it also there's a blueprint that's in existence. Everybody knows how it can be done because Marvel's done it. You introduce a character here, you introduce a character here. A few more, and boom, you've got your team movie. And just as you know, Marvel did the Avengers, which nobody, you know, twenty years ago, if you said the Avengers, and you know, differentiated between the Emma Peel version, um, that was her name, right? Yeah, Emma Peel. yeah, yeah. And what was his name? Steed. Uh, John Steed. John yeah. Steed. Uh, you would still have people scratching their heads, going, "No, if I was going to bet on any superhero movie, it would be the Super Friends." You'd have to explain something. Super Friends is the JLA. And they'd be like, "The JLA Justice League," then. Why would you correct me, you geek boy? And you get punched in the belly. <laughs> that was 20 years ago, That's kids. right. Today, not so much. So the Justice League is just waiting to happen. It just needs to be set up. It almost properly. did, but George Miller there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, it was almost a very right before the writer's strike, man. They had a script that apparently was like the Star Trek J.J. Abrams reboot of JLA movies, except you weren't rebooting a JLA movie. You were introducing it. Boom. It would have been this like... Uh, explosion of DC characters. It would have been the reverse of the Marvel Universe because they would have started with a team movie and then they just would have done the spinoffs. Done the spin-offs. Yeah. And then I, I guess Warner Brothers got cold feet as they were heading up toward the uh, the writer's strike and everyone, uh, what's his name? Uh, the dude who's in Cop Out, Adam Brody. Yeah. He was going to play Barry Allen, The right. Flash. Army Hammer was going to be Batman. He was going to play Batman. Yeah. Uh, the guy who wound up playing the Winklevoss twins, right? Yeah. Now he's playing now the Lone, Lone Ranger. Ranger. So uh, th- this was all about to happen. They were in Australia for a month. They were training. Um, and then all of a sudden they got the call where, like, Warner Bros. pulled the plug. The guy who directed Babe was going to do it. Or, well, the second one, Babe Pig in the City. But the guy was um, – I mean, he didn't direct Babe, did he, George Miller? That was the kind of big thing. It was like he produced He it. produced it. Yeah, but he did There was another it. guy who got the actual credit. But yeah. Babe, too, Pig in the City, he definitely directed. And that yeah, was yeah. the one where it was like – you're going to be bacon pig. You're like, going to die. Yeah, it was really terrifying. So that dude, they tapped to do uh, the Justice League movie and then pulled the plug. So George Miller had the, the Mad Max background, right? That's, That's right, of course, yeah. there as well. Yeah, a lot of people sitting there going, why, you, why do you go right to <laughs> Babe? <laughs> <laughs> you fat dick. You're too high to talk about this. <laughs> You're too hungry. Go eat, <laughs> go eat some ham. It is Sunday morning, Father's Day. And technically, I'm thinking like, oh, Babe would be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Miller didn't get to do one. No Justice League movie. Um, DC's got their chance at bat to start, you know, basically head at down bat. the path. Good catch. Yeah. Um, uh, so this weekend was important. They've they've previously tried to relaunch the Superman franchise um, in 2006 with Superman Returns. Yeah, which I spent yesterday morning rewatching. Did you really? Yes. Wow. It's a turd, isn't it? Holy fuck. It's not a turd. It's just like, who was responsible for this? Who said that this was okay? And then I looked at the math, dude. They spent $270 million making that. Wow. Like, to, to give you the comparison, Man of Steel, $225 million. And the inflation only goes up, right? Yeah, right. So essentially, $270 million on Superman Returns would be what today? $300 million? Easy. For a movie about the stoop, super stalker right. who just hangs outside of Lady Bobblehead's house and is just like, I miss you. I'm sorry I left without saying goodbye. Holding and, a boombox over his head. <laughs> it is. It's Superman anything. Um, it's, uh, it's a movie where Superman, I just rewatched it and wanted to make sure, never throws a punch. No. Lex Luthor does. 
It, once Superman winds up on the little Crypt, spoilers, Kryptonite Island off the coast of uh, Metropolis, because that's I was sitting there going, I don't even remember what the plot of this movie was. Then I remembered when I was watching real it. estate once again. But to be fair, Otisburg, but to, Otisburg, which is just like the Dick Donner, <laughs> like Lex Luthor so far or every Superman movie is predicated on a real estate deal <laughs> a swindle <laughs> or something it's about wanting land like superman the, the movie it's all about lex Luthor wanting to sink los angeles or california into the ocean so he'd have the best you beachfront know property. beachfront property yeah. um superman too uh, you know and well yeah the kryptonians come and we they're want gonna earth, earth yeah. we're gonna take earth that's real estate right there um you get to superman returns they bring in Kevin Spacey. You're like, holy shit. Kaiser Soze is going to play Lex. Spoilers. Kaiser. If, <laughs> fuck you. If you haven't seen that movie. Spoiler. Yeah, triple spoilers. <laughs> Kaiser Soze is going to play Lex Luthor. And his big fucking de- deal is real, real estate. estate. <laughs> now we get to Man of Steel, which is hands down probably the most visually impressive Superman movie ever made. And <laughs> at its core, it's also about real estate. Yes. Kryptonians come and like, we want Earth and Global we want to be estate. Krypton. Yeah. The Man of Steel, dude, is just really the Century 21 man, isn't he? <laughs> it really it's is. like, this is the great, the patron saint of real estate agents. Every real estate agent shouldn't have a little Jesus on their dashboard. They should have a little Superman statue. Right. All he does is protect real estate. That's what he does. He's the man. He's just there to keep the real estate values in check. Um, all right, so you got a movie, $270 million Superman Returns cost, open to $53 million. Which would be roughly sixty-five million to bucks today. Right. It eventually tops out at two hundred million in the U.S., which two hundred million is massive. I've never made any. All my works together are not worth two hundred million bucks. Right. But they also didn't cost two seventy. Good point. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to point that out. <laughs> um, and then abroad, it did another two hundred. So let's say Superman Returns worldwide did four hundred million bucks for a two hundred seventy million dollar. Right. Budget that's, of that four hundred, yes, yeah. and of that four hundred, studio gets back about two hundred. So, you know, they didn't. They lost a little bit of cash there, but more importantly, they lost step. They lost ground. Yeah, they, 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 that was supposed to, excuse me, kickstart a franchise, and it didn't do it. If anything, fucking kill the franchise for a long Put time. Put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth about Superman. And 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 when you watch the movie, it's not like it's fucking dog shit. Like everyone's trying, and it's a Wonderful mash note, like a love letter to the Dick Donner series, to the first two Superman movies. Um, although, like, they do weird things, like the Lois is not like Lois at all. No. Like, what Brandon Routh it does a fantastic job of Christopher Reeve, and he brings his own sort of humanism to it. He's a good actor. He never got enough credit, man. I worked with the guy, and I literally yeah, sure. know he's a good actor. Um, the, the girl, what's her name? Uh, Bosworth. Kate Bosworth. She doesn't. She didn't She's like awful casting. Awful casting. It was she, it was not good casting at all. Like she she trying, but like there's no and maybe it was underwritten. There's no spice that Margot Kidder had. She's like a teenager too. She comes off as like a teenager playing grown up in that film. Just, and I hate to be this guy because I'm like you know who am I to talk? You fat piece of shit. I'll just start by saying I'm a fat piece of shit with thinning hair. So disregard what I say. But she's blonde normally. Uh, Bosworth, yeah, yeah. That hair on that head probably as blonde. I've never, it looks normal or whatever, but her as a brunette, like whenever she was in profile, it looked like half of her forehead had been shaved to me. <laughs> like she just has a very high forehead and eight head. Like my wife, I always say, you got an eight head, but Kate Bosworth got a 12 head. <laughs> so the, the hair, she's almost got the opposite of my hairline and I'm balding right. from the back. She seems a little bit from the front. She should comb it forward. There's a lot of profile shots of her looking up at Superman in the, in the movie. And the whole thing, I could only thing I could concentrate on is like, Use your superpowers to give her some fucking bangs, dude. Like she needs some help up front. But she's not. She's not a bad actress because I've seen her in other things. Like I like her in that uh, Twenty One, the Blackjack movie. Yeah, she was good in that. I've seen her in Blue stuff. Crush. I thought she was. Yeah, good. yeah. But she just she movie. was not the choice for this. Or and again, I don't. There's no evidence in the script that. They, you know, hey, let's make her fun. <laughs> no. no, she's a surly, uh, rejected woman, Body single Julie. mother. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing's conceived by and executed by dudes. Um, some of them dudes who like dudes, and there's an absence of, you know, female. T- even even Parker Posey, who's like Lex Luthor's gun mall, is she's Miss Testmacher of the he, film, but like out of the twenties, <laughs> like a weird dialed back version. Um, so there's everyone's game, but it's just so locked into the past. And 
and it's nothing new. You know, it's we neither a seen... remake nor sort of an homage. It kind of falls between both of those, you know. And again, it's got that price tag that really is a fucking target on its chest. Like if he had done all this for like fifty million bucks, people would be like, oh, you know, what, you know what? he made a made a fucking fan film for fifty million bucks, but yeah. it worked. We made money. But when it's like two hundred seventy million, it's just like, dude. Have him punch something. Yeah. Have him fucking hit some other than an island. That's his big punch in the movie. He's, he uses laser vision to cut the fucking new kryptonite island free that Lex created based on stealing crystals from the Fortress of Solitude. Like, yeah. I don't know if you remember that plot. Yeah, it's sure. real convoluted. And then um, if he you picks throw them up in water, they become land somehow. Yeah. And then he mixes it up with a little kryptonite so that Superman, which I actually thought was kind of smart, but they don't really elaborate on it. Like he never flat out says, this whole fucking island is made of kryptonite. So I'm not only building a new land um, that will, you know, yes, probably kill the mainland of America as it continues to grow and billions will die. But this land, Superman can't even set fucking foot on. Right. So. I'm golden. I, yeah. I mean, like that to me, I was watching it yesterday, yesterday morning. I was like, it's kind of ingenious. Like Lex built a world that Superman can't come to. And nobody ever says it. Now, maybe they're like, it goes without saying. But I don't think so. Yeah. Like I would have remembered that and been like, oh, that's fucking sharp. And all I remember it as is like, oh, I had some fun. I was kind of for cock the fucking land deal and shit. So, um. So it all falls apart, of course, because Superman somehow finds the fucking strength and will to pick up an entire quasi kryptonite. It's not all kryptonite, to be fair, but let's say it's 25 percent kryptonite. Right. Still going to fucking hurt him like hell. There's a boss moment, man, where fucking Luthor stabs him with a fucking kryptonite shiv. Yeah, I remember that. And breaks it off, literally breaks it off. And that's another moment that nobody fucking says he stuck it in and broke it off, which I guess would have been too literal for a kid's movie. <laughs> Maybe a prison rape scene. <laughs> that would make it perfect. <laughs> but it's that's the only Superman movie I think of where they pierced his skin, right? Yeah. Like in all the other incarnations, they'll whip out a rock and be like, look at this. And he's like, ah. <laughs> Superman Returns, in, in, in its defense, has the greatest, one of the greatest Superman moments ever is when that bullet hits him in the eye. Fantastic. That's a great moment, right? That movie is made up of really great standalone moments, yeah. but its core story, which was I left and now I'm back, and the world, the girl that fucking loved me wrote a piece about so how. Fuck Superman. Yeah, and what a, an award for it. So it's like the world kind of validated it, and it's like, come on, I was nicest to her. Um, he pay your child support. That's the moral of the story. Holy shit. And that they did introduce, it was kind of, to be fair, it had these kind of like bizarrely revolutionary notions in it with spoilers. He has a kid. Yeah. They gave him a fucking child, but boy, did that write them into a fucking corner. It was a pointless addition. They were fixing something that wasn't broken. Like, why do you have to introduce that aspect to this story? It's just unnecessary. And oddly enough, it didn't do anything to like new, new blood, reignite the franchise. If anything, it was just the last gasp of a dying world. Yeah. Um, a, a shadow of Krypton itself, dude, of the bottled city of Candor, <laughs> if you will. Um, interesting to look at, but like a, piece of a bygone long dead world much more poetic look at me i'm a film fucking you're, film critic you were waxing i was um so that movie you know ultimately not only does it keep the franchise alive it kills the franchise costs them a bunch of money and puts it to sleep for a while thank god chris nolan comes along does the dark knight trilogy and warner brothers makes a shit ton of fucking money right. off of something they already own so you know with with uh dark knight coming to a close they were like, what do we, what do we do? You know, there's been talk. What else about- we have in the box? Exactly. And they're like, let's go to our, look, we've got a crown jewel who's in threatening, uh, threatened to becoming, uh, fucking Kermit or Mickey Mouse, even worse. Like at least Kermit, they pop in a movie here and there. Right. Mickey Mouse is like, it built the Disney company on the back of this rat. And then one day they were like, nobody gives a fuck about you. You could be on TV from time to time. Yeah. And even then they'll cancel you because nobody fucking cares about a mouth and mouse and pants anymore. Cause they can watch porn on the internet. <laughs> so you go be the corporate master and that's what you are. And that's what happens to Mickey Mouse. So Superman was in, in danger of becoming that. Like, we all know Superman, but, like, you, you hear writers talk about it. I've even said it. It's like, how do you write for Jesus? Yeah. Like, you can win everything until you whip out the rock. And, like, uh, and then he gets into that fucking uh, zombie phase. Right. Um, so 
they found a way to do it with Man of Steel. They said, let's get Zack Snyder, man. Let's get the guy who did Watchmen 300, and we'll do a fucking like... Sucker punch. Sucker punch. Um, I'm sure they didn't say that when they were like, let's get Zack Snyder. They should have. Someone should have screened Sucker Punch <laughs> before they made this film. Um, let's get this dude, and Chris Nolan will godfather this shit. David Goyer, who worked on the Batman movies as well. We'll, and we'll we'll start again, man. We won't do what they did of Superman Returns and just add another chapter to that with new people playing all those parts and some creepily looking like the people who had done it in the past and whatnot. Let's just fucking start again. They did something that like a lot of our generation was too afraid to do, which is like, oh, don't fuck with Superman. We all love the Superman series. And these cats are like, you know what? Nobody remembers the Superman series, like especially kids. So let's fucking do to this Superman, what Dick Donner Superman did to the George Reeves Superman. Right. Like when my dad took me to see Superman in 1977 or 78, whatever it was like, he, it was like, Oh my God, the one I watched, he laid on the fucking table and they blew a fan at him. Yeah, he jumped out of a window. Yeah. From the he literally jumped in the air. Board. That was their special effect. And so here, you know, their marketing campaign was, you will believe a man. You can, be, you will believe a man can fly. Right. And you did because the special effects back in those days were like, holy shit. It wasn't a dude laying on a table. And he, Christopher Reeves did this awesome thing. You always saw Superman with his hands in front of him and stuff. And he was the first one I know of who was just like, I'm going to dip him back here. Yeah. I don't even know if they did it in the comics. They must have in a I world of positions. Did. Yeah. But he was the first one in mainstream media who put his hands behind him. And he would bank, too. He'd put one hand forward and the other one back when he was making turns and stuff. He it, looked like he was aerodynamic, you know? He made but you And with the effects combined with that performance, you did believe a man could fly. And, and so as my father watched it, it was like, this ain't my fucking Superman. Like, and, but not in a shitty way. He was just like... Right on. Look how big this is. In fact, that was the very first superhero movie that they spent money on. The first one they spent a shit ton of money on was $55 million bucks in those days, uh, 1978, which I don't even know what that would be today. Let me see, man. Here we go. Oh, you know what? Thanks to a site called altfg.com. Internationally, Superman scored an astonishing, uh, for the time, for its time, $166 million. Approximately five hundred and thirty million dollars today. There you go. Um, and they pulled their information from Box Office Mojo. If that figure is accurate, bear in mind that the nineteen seventy eight Warner Brothers release was the first big budget superhero movie ever made. Cost reported fifty five million, which would be one hundred ninety six million today. Wow! So essentially, the cost of the first Superman movie is almost in line with the cost of Man of Steel. Man of Steel's two hundred twenty five million. But like, you know, but money's, what is it called? Inflation has brought money up. But in theory, they're not that far apart. Even back then, they were like, it's yeah. fucking bigger than life. Could you imagine the first time they do it? Like now you do a superhero movie, people are like, yeah, you probably pay out, pan out for you. Then you're the first one. They're like, look, we used to do these things for like a buck oh five. Right. Dude would jump up in the air. Why do you have to do this shit? $55 million. And again, $55 million today sounds like, well, eh, you know, it's a respectable, it's a pretty respectable budget. Go for 30, be safer. But like $55 million then, I'm sure Warner Brothers is just like, if this doesn't work, we are fucked. Yes. This is crazy. It and took it, it took the comic book movie out of kitsch and made it a big marketable enterprise. And who made it kitsch? Well, the fact that it was for kids. Comic books had been for kids since and, the and 40s Batman and 50s. Too, you know? The Bill Dozier campy sure, Batman. Sure, the TV series. Of... But even even before that, in terms of uh, the theaters, it was those serialized you know, cliffhangers. You know, They had Captain America and Captain Marvel and Black Hawk and Superman, Batman for a while. I mean, all those characters were treated sort of like B-movies at best, and they would just crank them out. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a safe bet because I figured kids would go and we'll make a little money back. It doesn't cost much to do. It was a huge risk in the 70s to put Superman up on the big screen and a lot of credit goes to the Salkins who you know have been vilified after the fact but why uh, were they vilified because after that they oh because they like let's make it for with canon and shit like yeah, that yeah they, they, they cheapened it you know they went on the cheap and just tried to milk every possible dollar out of it they they abandoned sort of the 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 value of giving it what it was worth and developing good scripts. And then they did Supergirl and they did all that sort of crap and it just, it went downhill. But initially they were the ones who said, look, we think this character is something that could support, you know, a major turnout for people to go to the movies. And no one believed that. And they were right. Do you know what they paid Marlon Brando? 
I remember. I remember it was it was news making. It was the astronomical figure of one million dollars to appear in that film. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And he's in it. I think most of his work is kind of he was on a sound stage alone because most of his interaction with Clark or Cal L is you know through the crystals and yeah. shit. And it's him just probably against a green screen. He had that- two scenes really. He had the the courtroom scene where he sentenced Zod to uh, the Phantom Zone, right? And then the putting the baby in the uh, spaceship scene. And then he did a lot of like, oh, I'm unsteady because the planet's blowing up. And, <laughs> and then he was a week worth of work. And he <laughs> <just> <laughs> was like, Goodbye. <laughs> Tail lights on Brando. <laughs> They're like, wow, a million dollars gets you that these days. Panned out, man. He he was above the line talent. They would ape this formula ten years later with Batman, where they hired Jack Nicholson to play like the villain, play yeah. a big role because Superman's villain. They had Gene Hackman, also a classic actor, um, to play a big role, the villain. But they said if you had enough stars in the supporting roles, you wouldn't need to know who Superman was. This unknown Christopher Reeve kid who they pulled out of Juilliard. Basically. And he was magic. <sighs> Fucking brilliant still. That he essentially played the Kurt Swan and, you know, with under the Dick D- Donner stewardship who should get all the credit. Yes. Like he spawned the fucking formally, put it together. Him, Tom Mankiewicz, who wrote the script. Yep. Everything you know about Superman in the movies comes from that Superman the movie. Um, and every superhero movie that's come since has followed the formula. They try to break it up a lot with Man of Steel of origin story. We tell the beginning all the way to his story interacting with the public and first, you know, first, first adventure. night out, first adventure, yeah. and then first few adventures, face a big villain. I'll be here for you credits and set it up for the next one. So um, when they did it, man, uh, Christopher Reeve, this kid nobody knew and shit, came in, played kind of the Kurt Swan version of Superman, winked at the camera. At the end of the movie... Right before the credits, he sails right, you know, over Earth and shit, and you get the impression they do it again in Man of Steel as well, some degree. Over the Earth, and you're like, fucking shit's safe. He's looking out. And then at the very last second, right before he banks off camera, he would look right down a lens right. as if to be like, I got you. I, yeah. I know you're there, too. Just like fucking Santa. Dude, you're seven <laughs> years old. I still get shivers. Like, he fucking looked at us. Like, he's looking out for us. Yeah. And then credits and shit. Played perfectly to a T. His Clark Kent was completely different than a Superman. And you believe that motherfucker put on glasses and greases his hair down. And you're like, that's not the same guy. Yeah, it's like, what an idiot. Who'd fuck him? <laughs> the super guy, on the other hand, what a fucking guy. And Lois Lane, who's all, you know, smart reporter. And, and she's a little more uh, airy. Not airy, but what would you say? And, and Distracted. I, I loved her, Mar- her Lois Lane. I, I think did too. She may still take the top award for me of TV movie, or maybe I like the cartoon one too. But movie Lois Lanes, I like Amy Adams a lot. But I think they gave Margot Kidder, they gave her Lois Lane more to do. She was like brass ball and <laughs> chain smoking. She and... was like his girl Friday, man. Yeah, like right. Rosalind Russell or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that. Real sharp and fast, and and also like. You know, like, fucking, I know I'm right. Uh, you know, how many T's are in Baffle and shit yeah, like right. that? So um, the the relationship between those two, there was magic there. But this Chris Reeve dude was phenomenal, man. He, he was two fucking different people and stuff. And, and he had human emotion and he was still ever trying to fit in. You know, that's the big thing you play with most of the superheroes now. I'm a freak. I'm emo. I'm outside of everybody. This guy, Superman, is the ultimate outsider. He's a fucking alien from a different planet. And so they didn't play it up so much. But perhaps more human than any of us, Kevin. There it is. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. And because he studied us, right? Quentin Tarantino does the whole monologue in Kill Bill. Like, he studied humanity. And Clark Kent is his statement on, on how Superman, Kal-El, sees human beings and right. stuff. So they knock it out the park, man. And, and essentially, everyone tries to do this move f- to the end of time. They stop with Man of Steel. Man of Steel is the first time. They're like, look, we all love that movie as well. But nobody remembers it as much as we do, like the older people. But they're like, we're going after kids. It's a kid's movie and stuff. Right. And we're building billion-dollar franchises. This ain't the – this is the fucking future. We're in a post-Dark Knight world. Let's do this different. Man of Steel does it different. They break up the narrative. They they do a bit of origin. They fuck around with time. Essentially, short review of the movie, it's like the Batman begin or overview, not so much review – it's like the Batman Begins of Superman movies. Right. It sets everything up. It goes back and tells his origin out of time sequence so you're not sitting there just watching it linear fashion like this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Right. Hobo Superman has flashbacks and he remembers what his youth was like. That's right. <laughs> Why is he hobo? Because apparently he just 
goes around so the country. Drifter. Why not drifter? That's more romantic because he goes around doing poorly paid day jobs and it just doesn't shave and he's just a hobo. He's got a little stick with a pack on his back with a, you know that's red with a little Superman logo on it. It's his cape, you know, all his belongings <laughs> tied to the end of a stick. His bindle. And he just walks the rails and hops on 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 box cars and just goes around the country listening to Pearl Jam as yeah, well. That's right. Uh-huh. And then uh-huh. lucky for him, he accidentally falls into uh-huh. a spaceship from Krypton from twenty thousand years ago. What was this? <laughs> Hey, I got lucky, didn't I? The last piece of my homeland is where I was working at a bar slinging Budweiser's he, there, to truckers. There was beer, man. Somebody, somebody on Twitter was like, Superman drinks Budweiser in this movie. He's, he did in Superman Returns as well. At one point, Clark Kent and Jimmy are in a bar, and he's swigging Budweiser. I, I, he didn't do that in the other ones, did he? Yeah. Or maybe he did in the fucking diner, you know, where he gets beat up by the fucking Well, dude. in three, he drinks up a storm. Right, when he's dark when Superman. He's, when he's bad Superman. Uh, he's, he's pussy those, and beer. He takes those peanuts and yes. starts breaking all the bottles with the peanuts. Love that scene. Which I'm sure Chris Reeve was just like, I can't wait to play <laughs> bad Superman. Yeah, bad Superman. Oh my God, I've been playing good Superman for so long. And I'm sure as he was doing it, he's like, this peanuts thing's fucked up, but feels good. <laughs> <laughs> feels good to be bad. Pa-ting. Um... In this one, man, uh, they they go a uh, kind of different route altogether. They break up time. Like, you spend the first 18 minutes on Krypton, which is actually close to Superman the movie. Very much so. They always got, except for Superman Returns, deviated from that format. They open with uh, some writing that says, you know, the last son of a dying planet or some such shit. They don't show it to you. But most Superman origin stories, most Superman media, they always take you to Krypton show you how fucking shit began. Right. This the sacrifice of, of Jor-El and Lara is important. The fact that they have to say goodbye to their only child and put it in a, in a Moses-like, put it in a basket and send it down send the it river. Send it down the river. Hope yeah. Pharaoh finds it. Yeah. And, shit. and then somewhere along the line, he went from Moses to Jesus because he becomes a messianic figure. Well, he is the, he is the son sent to earth in order to save us. And you got it both ways. If you're looking for a faith, like let's say you're one of these uh, mixed faith households where you're like one parent's Jewish, one parent's Christian. Superman is the bridge between the two, man. Well, like, two Jews created it. Two Jewish kids created it. They they had the Moses mentality, I think. And then white on. Protestant America corporation. Put them on a cross. <laughs> they sort of morphed That's him into That's the only way we appreciate Jewish people <laughs> around here is on a cross, on a cross. saving us. <laughs> um, so he... In in this version, we start on Krypton, first 18 minutes, and then just as what, the rocket is heading to Earth, and you're like, here we go, fucking the truck and fucking baby super dick, which we've already seen in the opening frames. Yeah. They can't make a Superman origin story without <laughs> like, dick. look at his baby dick. Look at it. <laughs> they did it in the That's other one. That's super now, is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so yeah, circumcised, man. He ain't super. I see no head on that. Shit's uncut. Um, they start. You, you think they're going to hit the ground. And it's like, oh, fuck. He's going to, you know, just do the whole thing again. Suddenly, it hits before it hits the ground. It switches over to Gordon's fisherman. Yeah, you think he's a fucking Mrs. Paul? <laughs> it's the it's the deadliest super catch. You think they you think they switched reels with fucking what was that movie Perfect Storm? You're like, what happened? You expect Clooney to be there? Diane Lane's in it, That's so you're right. like, holy shit! It is the Perfect Storm. She was in that movie. This movie she's a little more convincing. Yeah, I remember seeing that movie and being like, "That's the worst." I could do a better Boston accent than that. She was off. She was like, she was "The harbor." They're all gonna die out of the harbor. <laughs> she was off her game that way. <laughs> and this was she pretty good. Yeah. She has a nice line, memorable line, where she's just like, nice suit, son. But it's done like she's not even on camera. She just kind of throws it away. So, boom, they pick him up as an older man. And then the rest of the movie, you know, is done f- following the current timeline, but periodically he sees something. Where it triggers like fucking oh, flash school bus, yeah. And Pearl Jam plays. Bus. Dun, 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 I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sullen because I'm adopted. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got fucking problems. Oh, this ain't your daddy, Superman. He ain't happy to be Superman. No, it's a he fucking isn't. burden, man. Oh, yeah. It's uh, and and nothing about it is your daddy, Superman. Right down to his daddy. Jor El in this one is like, I'll kick your fucking ass. I'll ride a dragon and kick your ass. Yes. The old Jor El was just like, You're all fools. Krypton's exploding. I told you, so. the planet's not going to be around for long. So everyone has to listen to me. So, like, if only he had a more commanding voice. Let's get in the space ox and leave this planet. If only he had a, 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 a more assertive timber. <laughs> I, can't, I can't agree with a chief scientist. Sounds this weak. If only we had Hawkins talking through a box. <laughs> 
then Hawkins tells me we're exploding. The core of the planet is about to explode. Let's get the fuck off this planet because that's, that's the voice of science. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the other guy is the voice of somebody who wants a million bucks to put on a white wig. Someone is telling his lines in an earpiece. <laughs> <laughs> this dude is phoning it in. <laughs> um, this time around, it's Russell Crowe. Yeah. Who is, uh, this is the most I think I've ever liked Russell Crowe in my life. So much so that I was like, I wish Russell Crowe as jor was my father, who could appear to me, spoilers, from time to time and tell me, duck, yeah. move. Move your head to the left. Put your, this is how pussy works. Like, he just, he's his educator and shit like that. But on Krypton, he's chief badass scientist. And he wears, like, fucking cool-ass armor-looking clothing. Yeah. And we first meet him. Uh, they're giving birth to baby Superman, his wife is, which we'll find out later on is the first natural childbirth in Krypton history in years. That follows the comics a little bit. Yeah. Like, Man of Steel, the John Byrne reboot. He was like, it was a sterilized society. And I, I think the idea there, if I remember correctly, too, was, like, Superman was born more of intimacy than fucking a test tube or something right. like that. They play that up here as well, big time. Big time. Um, at the same time, of course, as we all know, as always has to be, Krypton is dying. Somehow they've exploited in, in this 21st century version. You know, they've mined the fucking shit out of it. The it's natural like, resources have been course. expended. They're like, there's a fucking smart bomb. That was the other word. What's the, um, the renewable energy bomb? <laughs> yes. That's the only thing it's missing. <laughs> uh, with this, with the search for clean energy has led us to destruction. <laughs> we should have trusted oil. <laughs> Superman, sponsored by Exxon. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> the stable, unstable planet core leads to the breaking down of Krypton, as we all know. jor once again, is talking to the council about, I don't know, what, the fucking lava pits shooting out of the fucking planet's asshole don't hint. tell you anything? <laughs> Let's get in the bus. <laughs> Why are you still wearing your headdresses? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> No, let's not stand on ceremony here, <laughs> members of the council. Look, I agree. You're in charge. That hat says it. But still, <laughs> let's go. Let's start exploring some new venues. Get your hat box. Get your haberdashed ass let's, uh, on the rocket out of here. Krypton's the Lovitz, okay? And I say what we need to do is find a new place to do our show. We have to look for the improv. Somewhere out there, there's a universal improv that will make for a better show than this dying world. There is lava shooting out our ass, people. <laughs> that ain't natural. Look, the you don't planet need to be a is to know yeah, that holy. once giant spouts of lava start shooting through the earth, the, the, the planet's crust, <laughs> that it might be time to vacate. I knew that shit when I was a busboy, long before I went to science school. <laughs> you mean college? Yes. Yeah. Did That's you it. even go? Well, now that we're all dying, no. But, but does it matter? I slept at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> And also, like, show me the scientist who's also pointing out lava's coming out of the Earth's ass. I didn't go to school. It's a triumph for me, Jorel. Don't try to put me down. Like, as the planet dies, Jorel filibusters with the Kryptonian Council today, aren't you, Jor? They're like, it's kind of. It's not so much a Superman movie as uh, Superman goes to Washington. That's right. Um, well, listen here, the, the whole planet's going to explode. <laughs> like, fucking let him talk. He'll pass out eventually. <laughs> and that's why I say we can talk about the space bus. He starts as Jimmy Stewart and he ends as Marlon Brando. <laughs> right. um, in this one, jor is trying to convince the council to get off the planet when fucking, boom, this is where, of course, it deviates. This ain't your fucking daddy, Superman, bitch. General Zod and his forces show up, blast through the fucking doors of the council and start slinging around like, these fools have led us to fucking doom. Yeah. And immediately blows away someone wearing a big hat. <laughs> he does not like those hats. <laughs> it's because this guy's got the right idea. He's like, you can't talk these hat people into getting on a ship and getting out of here. You shoot one. But he doesn't want to get follow. on the ship. Zod comes in. He's all pissed off. Yeah, okay. All right. You want to change regimes or whatever? But jor rightly points out, you're going to be the leader of Dying Planet. You're missing the point once again. Even your side, Zod, is missing the point of what we need to do here. And he, yeah, it's true. He's like, well, we'll get rid of these old fools. And then we'll yeah, be in Zod's charge. Point. He's going to be in charge of what? And they're like, yeah, we're in charge Lava of Lava shooting out of your asshole. That's what you're that in charge of. That goes to something they take care of in the third act. Spoilers. Yeah, and this whole thing, be, spoilers, by the way. Don't way listen to this until you've seen the movie. Agreed. If, yeah. Unless you've seen Superman, put it to the side. Because all we're going to do is talk about it in detail and shit. Um, 
in they reveal later on at the end of the movie that uh, you know every Kryptonian baby yeah is yeah. he's genetically designed to do genetically this designed That's, to he, do he one no choice. job he has no choice which I thought was actually kind of cool like in the first in Superman two. General Zod's just like, we will have vengeance on the son of our jailers. That's it. That's yeah. his motivation. Just well, Revenge is a pretty good motivation. Especially for a movie. Yeah. But in the 21st century, you need a little more than hate, dude. Let's be justified. You got to look. At the, basically, the villain can't be so much a villain as an anti-villain. Like, it right. makes the world make sense to him if it just worked this way. But unfortunately, it kills a lot of fucking people. So his justification is he is genetically predisposed to, to keep Krypton for Kryptonians or to extend the Krypton way of life, to protect and preserve the Krypton way of life, right. to make sure his people endure, blah, blah, blah. Yes. I guess it still doesn't fucking... If if that's your job, you would want to get off a dying planet. Yes, you would. That was my first problem with the movie, was like he, is, he wants to defend the race, but yet he is dooming them to extinction by staying on this planet and not siding with jor and getting everybody in the fucking shuttle. And it's also a race, they reveal, that has gotten off the planet many They've times before. They've got a before. history. They've got yeah. a history of traveling through the stars and landing and, 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 and colonizing other habitable planets and living their for lives. For eons. For eons. Prior. But that's now that, their that's not no longer so an advanced. option. Yeah, yeah. suddenly. Now we're like, going to stay here and die. Only I'm going to be in charge of staying here and dying. Because it's in his genetic code. Because it's his genetic code. He's got a badass bowl cut. Yeah. It's Michael Shannon, who's really good. Great actor. Really great actor. Um, they don't give him like the, you know, why do you say these things when you know I will kill you for it? <laughs> like type lines of, of Terrence Stamp's General Zod. Yeah. He he gets to, you know, he Chew has to say shit open. like fucking release the world engine and shit like that. But he also gets to come out and just, he has one really good line where he's like, I was raised. I was genetically trained for this. Where were you raised? On a farm? You trained on a farm? Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. Yeah. Just the way the fucking bile he puts in a farm. You're like, man, I never want to go to a farm again. Yeah. Farms are bad places. Apparently farmers on Krypton were not considered <laughs> no, a, way a, down a, a the worthy line. profession. It was like there are fucking glory holers and bathrooms. <laughs> Random strangers will suck your fucking space dick. And under that, farmers. Yeah. What are you, boy? He's like, well, uh, I guess my farmer. Yeah, yeah. I was raised on Kansas. He has a Superman has a good, good line at the end of the movie, where the general is just like, "How do we know we can trust you? What are your interests are good for the United States?" And he's like, "I was, I was born, I was raised in, in Kansas. Kansas." Yeah. He's like, "I was American as it gets," but that's another thing they kind of do in the new version. No more truth, justice in the American way. And even the bright colors of the flag that most people identify with Superman's outfit, rightfully or wrongfully, because there's a lot of yellow in the original Superman costume yeah. as well, which is not represented on the American flag unless you paint your stars yellow, which most people don't. Unless you have an older flag that's starting to age and <laughs> mildew a little bit. Um, now the colors are way muted, the color palette. You've seen the suit, of course. Yeah, because TV. it's important to suck all the joy out of the character. So if you had a <laughs> bright suit that was fun to look at and it had a little sense of hopefulness and brightness to it, that would give anyone a reason to not want to slit their wrists. So you can't have that in a Christopher Nolan project. There's, uh, there's, but it's also different. Like he, the flag, he doesn't represent America anymore. Now he represents the world. Yes. When the character was created as a creation of North America, he was an American superhero, mm -hmm. but the, you know, if you want to make a billion, $2 billion, you got to appeal to people outside the North America border. Start being like, uh, Superman cares about China as well. You sure, know that, yeah. right? Look, he's over the Indian Ocean. He's fixing that one too. So those colors, less flaggy, more muted. Yeah. More, you know, darker blue. I think you could use a good darker wash blue. with Clorox Plus. <laughs> Clorox 2 that actually brightens colors in the wash. You could use a, just a quick run through at the, at the laundromat. When they reveal the costume for the first time, you're just like, the look on his face is like, should I wash this? Yeah, it looks a little muted to Who me. Who wore this before me? Jeez, this looks this good. Let me blow some space dust off of this. This is, if you look at the Superman movies as songs or bands or whatever, eras of bands, Dick Donner, Superman, I think we can all agree, Beatles song. Yes. Classic. Like, you play right. it then, works, play it now, still fucking works. Yeah. You know, some of the beats may be like, oh, they, you know, there's no wee, they didn't have a whammy bar or some such shit back then. There was no dubstep. It's missing, you know, the earmarks of what would make it current, but it's still classic, timeless. Brilliantly crafted, just fun to listen to, but also has some meaning under it. It's, it's well done. It's, it's, it's the best pop music has to offer. Superman Returns would be... Uh, not a Cure song, but a Cure cover band yes. song. Right. Very, very emo, very mopey, 
Um, not so much like I'm gonna fucking kick your ass and save humanity as much as like I've got to move an island. You know, <laughs> you know very angsty. My girlfriend doesn't love me anymore. She wrote a big piece in the planet, <laughs> but it's my fault because I left. I didn't when say I goodbye. Did. <laughs> Should have left a note. Knocked her up and left. That was a little Kevin Smith doing Robert Smith, man. That's well done. Thank you. Uh, so in any event, this version to me, obviously we differ. I would say this version to me is more like a Metallica song. It's just like, man, 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 relentless, relentless in your face. Jor-El is a badass ass kicker. Man, 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 little baby into space. Put him into space and watch him go to Earth. Man, 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 baby, baby on a boat saving dudes on a boat. Oil of ra- you know, just ve- it's relentless. Yeah. When the movie begins, how many two and a half hour Metallica songs are there? <laughs> it depends which album, man. <laughs> Maybe something off Ender Sandman. You know why they don't have two and a half hour uh, Metallica songs? Doesn't hold out that long because that fucking gets tedious. It is. A, it, movie's a little long. How long is it? Two and a half hours. Yeah, and the la- it feels like the last twenty minutes is just those two dudes punching each other. You know why? Because the last twenty minutes is just those two dudes <laughs> knocking over fucking buildings. Superman kills more people in Metropolis than any supervillain ever could, and never once does it dawn on him. Maybe I should take this fight outside. Maybe we should go to a cornfield <laughs> or a. Or that a- doesn't matter. Even if he's fighting in a cornfield, even if he's just like, "You dare to threaten my mother," he's beating the shit out of him in a cornfield. You're like, All right, at least he's taking out some cornfields. Right. Very next second, he takes out two fucking like uh, cornmeal stacks, whatever they put the food in, so, uh, silos. Yeah. And then it goes through a fucking 7 Eleven and a gas station. <laughs> and an IHOP and a Sears. <laughs> and it lights up. And you're just like, boy, I hope the town's really empty. Luckily, Smallville looks very underpopulated. Yeah. Like most You towns. know what doesn't? Metropolis doesn't look underpopulated. Just nothing but skyscrapers tumbling down and crushing humanity. Spoilers way in advance. The last fucking 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, it, they go for it, man. Like they, you've never seen destruction like this. The disregard for human life in this film is repugnant to me. It's, it's it's incomprehensible. He fucks up Metropolis in such a without way without a that- blink, without even a second thought. He doesn't give he doesn't give a shit about anybody until a family of four is going to be talking- cut in half by the li- by the heat vision. Are you That's talking the only about time Superman? He can. Superman, Zack Snyder. I thought <laughs> yeah, you were talking both. about Zack. Both. <laughs> And it Chris is, Nolan. No one gives a shit about people in this movie. This is, well, to be fair, going into a Superman movie or going to a comic book movie in general, of course, you're like, I want to see people in Jeopardy and people get saved. And we do see people get saved. All those buildings, you have to assume, like you do in most movies these days, they evacuated the city. Uh, did they? All those How about the people who are running there? in terror on the streets below the buildings like Perry White as they are coming down on them? And yeah. so does Jenny three, Olsen. Three people live. So that's good enough. Those are the only people I care about in Metropolis. The rest, are, the rest are nameless, faceless people, Ralph, who shouldn't be in those buildings anyway. Uh, you belong. You belong in this Zack Snyder universe. <laughs> you got to expect a little. I, I, I was a little taken aback by Superman's. He doesn't quite have the like, no, Zod, the people or anything like that. Right. It's, it's like fuck the people. It's well, you it's and a, me. it's a lot of hurling through buildings, and it's just like man, I hope the people weren't in those buildings. And can someone well. buy Zack Snyder a tripod to put his camera on? I like the handheld shit. You didn't like that, even in the courtroom scene in the beginning. Yeah, you're on Krypton, and you can't even see what the fuck's going on in the courtroom. I liked it. There's a kind of intimacy to it. Also, I know it's like I know it's, uh, a, it's an affected kind it's of like thing, but Cloverfield Superman. It was. It made me feel like I was it watching was Law and Order. Relentless. <laughs> With the I moving liked it. camera. But I mean, th- again, you got to deviate from the format. So many people put that shit on sticks or, of course, a crane or a dolly. And it's always these beautiful moving tracking shots. This is, it dirties it up a little bit. I, kinda, I like that. Aspect. Well, you use it where it's appropriate. I mean, if you're in a courtroom and the world's not yet blowing up, why mm-hmm. is the camera shaking? Can we see the action? What's going on? If you want to do it in the action sequences, I can see that. Right. But it seemed to me like it wasn't effective filmmaking, especially that last mind-numbing half hour just that this the relentless destruction the 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 roland emmerich style destruction of everything over and over and over again i was thinking if you were oh going, my god you're right i guess it kind of goes to him doesn't it, it it's like godzilla it's like all those shitty independence movies day. In the it was independence like the first day. one where you were like you watched a trailer where it's like hey a fucking spaceship so holy shit they blew it to shreds like yeah, you're right man that's where we started seeing buildings blown the fuck apart then we saw it in real life in september 11th yes which has always unnerves me. Like what when you see it in the movie, it's just like it was very chilling. That it was a recreation almost of that when they're running in the streets. You see that cloud of dust coming from the collapsed buildings, chasing them and stuff. And I understand like that's imagery now. Everyone, you know, you can borrow from it. Happened to us. It's in the collective consciousness. But it always that that to me when I saw it like the Transformers. First time I saw that, they had like some snaky looking fuck 
crushing a building and the building was going down. People were on the floor. I was just like, this is a little too... I mean, I understand you go to movies and they show planes going down and that's close to reality. It yeah. happens. And then you go to movies and they show murders and stuff like that. That happens. But I don't know. For me, I was just like, oh my God, man. Like, we've seen this in real life. We actually saw what this looks like in real life video footage. You but see it- a lot of buildings coming down in Metropolis. They destroy... I mean, they do this weird thing at one point where they kind of pull back and show you the rest of the city is okay, but they take out what looks like fucking 20, 30 city blocks. Yeah. Like, it goes for it. it. And again, maybe this movie is a response to Superman Returns, but for a guy who sat there going like, <coughs> Superman doesn't punch anybody. He lifts an island in this movie. This Man of Steel is the exact opposite. Like, he's going to punch fucking everything. Everything's going to get fucking blown up. Everything's going to get destroyed. There's no, he's not going to whip around the world backwards and the building's going to go up. They're like, this is what happens. And so by the end of the movie, you understand why Metropolis of all fucking cities would embrace like the Superman. Even though it's his fault. <laughs> why would they embrace it when it's his fault? Because Everything bad that happens in this movie is his fault. They're scared of him, Ralph. They're like, <laughs> we better take is. him to our hearts because <laughs> the can't, handcuffs won't hold him. The military can't stop him. I guess we just bow down and, and worship this alien destructor. Destroyer of worlds has come to come to our planet. But he's, he's responsible for bringing Zod there by setting the fucking beacon off. He <laughs> does everything bad in that movie that creates all the problems. But he's, make, not a, he's not a solution to anything in this film. But that's what makes him a hero, Ralph. He created the problem, and he also solves it. You've got to admit... By destroying 30 city blocks. Better than the world, Ralph. They were going to create... Look, I'll fight you on this one. I don't want to see Earth turn into Krypton. I if don't a couple either. fucking blocks of Metropolis goes, so be it. Like... Because your family you wasn't s- in there. My family was in the Daily Planet building, you son of a bitch. <laughs> once you see... The, something called a world engine or some, or one of those ships hovering over Metropolis. The world engine looks a lot like a mechanical spider, doesn't it? Notice that. <laughs> there were a few. For those of you unfamiliar, I at one point was involved with the writing of the Superman movie. Just go to YouTube and, and enter Super, Kevin Smith Superman. Watch a clip from an evening with Kevin Smith if you don't already have the DVD. Uh, back in 96, full disclosure, I worked on a Superman movie. And key elements were little nods. I, I Honestly, I was sitting here watching this movie, and from time to time I was like, I wonder if that's – is that directed at me? <laughs> is that like the world's most private, private joke? Um, and then I realized, oh, John Peters is the producer, so maybe it's more of a joke for him. Yeah. Um, but, but fucking being in the movie business or in the entertainment business, of course, I assumed it was for myself. Of course, you have to. And this is a, people in the entertainment business, difference between normal people. Um, normal people walk into a room and see a bowl full of apples and be like, I wonder who these apples for. And people in the entertainment business walk into a room, see a bowl full of apples and be like, someone left apples for me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so naturally that's where I went. Um, I'm sorry. Where did I, where was I? Where did I just leap off from? Uh, we were talking about the, the destruction. You said in defense, he's pr- keeping the world from being turned into Krypton and, Bingo. and some of these sacrificial lambs, it just has to be done. But uh, my take was even beyond the storyline as a filmmaker, it's ineffective in my opinion, and this goes for all these blockbusters that fall into the same trap. If you're going to make a, a, a drama, for example, and you want to be a heart-rending drama, mm. you don't have your lead character cry for the last half hour of the film. Because mm. eventually people become numb to that experience and they say, well, I don't give a fuck if she's crying anymore because I don't care. If you're doing a comedy, I you don't do 30 fucking... minutes of slapstick at the end. You know? What about Notebook? You drop Notebook, it Notebook in. you cry from the moment it begins to the end. It's like one long tearjerker. But it, there's, a, there's a, an up a and down to it. it. There's an up and down quality Fair to enough. it. I Tommy, found, you're right. You don't do 30 minutes of slapstick. I was so numb to all of that by the end of that film that I kept looking at my watch saying, okay, when... I was so bummed when he didn't get sucked into the black hole. When he was still there on the earth, I was like, oh, fuck. Here we go again. Oh, when Zod, really, like, when Zod, when Zod, Zod was left over. Yeah. And I just think... It, it, and my example would be Iron Man 3, which I went in thinking, uh-oh, Shane Black, you might be a little heavy-handed with the action stuff. Everything. There was like three really well-done set pieces in terms of action in that film. And the rest, it's on the very shoulders of, of Robert Downey Jr. is barely in the suit during that time. And I thought those moments were so effective because they're just heart-stopping and you're just you're, you're, you're completely enthralled by it and then it's over and then it goes back to story and then there's another moment like that. People falling out of planes and he's catching people over the ocean. They're making a human chain and everything. Great. And then it goes back to the story again. The last half hour of this film, I was like, when when do I get my respite? When do we get back into something that resembles story? It was just relentless. I it's a far more, as you pointed out before, a Chris Nolan version of it. Like, if you're looking for the Dick Don or Superman, Ralph just pointed it out. It's probably Iron Man 3, which has actually the 
heritage, the lineage of a Dick Donner movie because Shane Black, as the director, wrote Lethal Weapon, which is directed by Dick Donner. Right. And the, the movies have a similar sort of winking, kind of like, you know, hey, we're all having a good time. Can you believe I'm in a fucking suit that flies? Like, it's it's all played seriously, but at the same time, uh, thanks to Robert Downey Jr., it's a fucking charm factory. Yeah. This, uh, in the Nolan verse, in both Batman and in now Man of Steel, it's not that. There's no sort of winking at the camera. It is all so earnest. I remember seeing Batman Begins the first time. People were like, what do you think? You're a huge Batman fan. I love the Tim Burton one, you know, for, uh, even though now you look at it and you're like, wow, it's pretty, pretty fucking cartoony. But still, it was a big event movie for us at the time. And see his Batman done properly and whatnot. I remember after I saw Batman Begins, I saw it in Vancouver. We were up there. Shoot, catch a release. Walked out theater. Scott Mosier was up there with me. Walked out the theater and somebody was like, oh, it's fucking you. What do you think? And I was like, it's really earnest. Like, I went in there expecting, you know, the Tim Burton one. You got Jack Nicholson chewing the scenery. You got joking and stuff like that, as well as the heroics. And even the score is like, but da 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 It's very big and it's operatic. Operatic yeah. over the top and stuff. But at the time, we all thought it was real. Like, crazy enough, in 1989, we were like, this is the realest fucking Batman that's ever been done. And it, you watch it now, it's pretty damn far from that. But Batman Begins just felt like they took a camera into the real world, shot a cop movie, and just put a cape and tights on. But you can do that with that character. That's my point. Is mm -hmm. With Batman, you can get away with that because he's a character driven by tragedy, driven by a morose sort of vengeful attitude. He's a human dude with no superpowers. I mean, that you can play with that and make it work in that sense. Mm -hmm. This film is about a guy who flies, who has superpowers, who flies around, who is better than the rest of us, and is a hopeful person. Uh, presence for good on this planet that's his whole purpose for being is to help people he is an uplifting bright shining uh light in a, in a sea of shitty morass <laughs> and this sucked him down into the morass versus putting him above it and i resented that as i was watching it because i knew i was in trouble when i read an article and Zack snyder said yeah we took the uh, red briefs off the costume because i want this is this is a superman who lives in the real world and to, to as if if you took red briefs off the guy's suit, that suddenly it was going to make everything real. And I said, that's the wrong way to go into this because it's not real. This guy is the ultimate representation of all things fantasy, of all, every little boy who dreamed he could fly, who, who put a, a cape on his back with clothespins and ran through the field wanting to be that guy. Which they do in Which this Which they movie. do, and it's like, what's he emulating? What has he seen before that makes him put a cape on his back with clothespins? He doesn't exist. There's no Superman for him to look to, and I want to be like that guy. I saw that. When I saw the trailer the first time, I was like, oh, maybe it's meant to be some other kid at the end of the movie. Who That's wants what I was to be. hoping for. But then it's him, and you're like, wait a second. What ta what snake eating the tail type moment is this? If he's the first cape wearer, who is he pretending to be? It, it's It's a... It's a joyless enterprise for the most part, except for the moment where Cavill is flying for the first time and a smile comes across his face and he says, wow, this is great. There was a brief moment where they said, okay, here, for you people who have a soul or a heart, here's your moment. Now, now we're going to go back to your regularly scheduled bullshit. Oh, good boy, you saw a different movie. I was so disappointed in the fact that there's no joy whatsoever in this character. It was just all sucked out of him. To me, and I, not to keep leaning back on the Donner thing, because everyone says to me, that's old and that doesn't matter and doesn't care. Yeah, but when young Clark Kent is racing that train in Smallville and he realizes what he can do and the way he kind of impishly puts it over on his friends by getting to his house before they even pull up in a car and they're all like flummoxed. He gets a little bit of a kick out of having those powers, as we all would if any of us had those powers. And there's nothing but just daddy issues and just emo fucking bullshit with this Clark Kent throughout the majority of this film. And I thought a little of that would have gone a long way in this movie in terms of humanizing it for me. I agree, and I bet you... Well, I don't agree with you. I agree a little bit more humor. I, I, I didn't think it was joyless. I, like, really dug it. I'll tell you, I, from the moment it started, I was sitting there going... I was sitting back. I, I talked about it when I called in. I was sitting back in my chair, had my food all around me and whatnot, laying literally on top of my gut like a shelf of food. And then as soon as it began, and it fucking begins and doesn't stop, it's just like, bam, this is Krypton, and fucking bam, this is happening, bam, motherfuckers are getting killed, and bam, the planet's going to go. 
Bam. I was just, I actually had to lean forward. I was engaged. I thought the whole opening, the whole Krypton stuff was fine for me. I thought, even though Krypton looks like Detroit <laughs> on, a, like on a bad day, I was like, these people are advanced. This is like, this is the, the <laughs> uplifting future of Krypton. I don't want to live on this fucking It looks like hole. Krypton's been a victim of Devil's Night. <laughs> yeah, right. It looked like to me they were almost building it like a bee society, like a, a kind of, it looked hivish yeah. when they showed it in moments. But agreed. That the first, the Krypton stuff is worlds better than the other Krypton stuff. Yes. Like, uh, not only, same, they accomplish the same thing. Hey, the planet's blowing up. Hey, we got to get this kid off of it. Um, this one, I, they, they want, they get it emotional. Even though Russell Crowe never really brings it above a certain tone, which works for the character and whatnot, he's, he gets emotional. Yes. Like, he gets you emotional. And, and the moment where they put the kid in the basket and to send him off the rocket ship is changed. Dramatically, this is another like this is where we deviate completely from the Superman mythos. In the Superman movies of yore, the both Lara and Jor El watch the rocket take off, and then once it's clear, they're done. They're done, and the planet is crumbling, and they die with Krypton. Goodbye, my son. And Krypton blows up as the rocket takes off into space. Not in this version. No. In this version, the rocket takes off into space, and Krypton does not. Spoilers does not blow. Gets up. a little more time. Um, Krypton does get a little more time, and I don't know what that was necessarily in the service of. Because you have to t- turn Zod into a giant space dildo and shoot him up into a spaceship. But you could have done that sooner. What happens I know. is Zod comes in, takes over the council, as we said before, hits, uh, shoots somebody with a fucking hat, uh, arrests Jor-El, then jor el fucking throws some space judo on him. To- that's it. Suddenly you're like, right on, this ain't fucking Marlon Brown. This yeah. motherfucker can fight and Where shit. Where was he trained? In the Gladiator movie. <laughs> 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 He's a scientist. He has been bred since the, the Genesis chamber to be a scientist. How come all of a sudden he's an ass kicking dragon rider? Where, where did he pick up that gene from the, the gene pool when he's supposed to be bred purely for intellect and science? Where he's obviously been fucking around with science. One yeah. could take the leap and be like, if he's willing to like literally put his wiener in his wife and have a baby the old fashioned way, which he's, apparently nobody he's reading Karate this. Made for Dummies. Absolutely. He's just like, or, or maybe he's like, look, I know their genetic code. Like, this is a dude who implants him him and his personality into a computer that can react with his son in yeah. real time. Thank God he becomes... Decades later. jor so. Exposition and provides everything that Clark needs to that know for the fun. rest of the it was, it was pointless and... Oh, it was fun oh, when yeah. he's like, duck. What? Over, uh, come on, dude. The fucking moment where he's like, it's you Jor-El's can save movie. her. It becomes Jor-El's you can movie. save them all. Like, that fucking made me cry where he's like, you can save them all. The, the way he fucking delivers that line, you're like, yeah, Superman, go save them all. It becomes Jor-El's movie. The point of the movie is birth fathers are good. Adoptive fathers are bad. That's Explain. what the point of the film is. Explain. Jonathan no, Kent, Jonathan Jonathan Kent, Kent. is my favorite character in the Superman mythos because without Jonathan and Martha Kent, that kid doesn't grow up right. He, he the, the the magic of that he would story have been the is, spoiler of worlds, a god amongst right. you know if he that, falls in the wrong hands. The crux of the Superman story is that if it had fallen into the hands of any other couple in America. This cat would not have been a good guy, and he is the best guy. Right. I mean, that's the nature of the character. He's the best guy we have, right? Because these two people are so loving and so caring and so giving of others and so committed to well-being of others that they instill that in their child. And the adoption parents are the difference. That's the difference between him being a bad guy or a good guy. Fair enough. In this film, He's a, he's 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 a muted character. He's like, oh, well, you know what? Should you let those kids die in that bus? Yeah, maybe, maybe you should have. Just, oh, I disagree. Just, he's a, just don't he show yourself. A- don't show yourself. Don't do anything for anybody. Just just hide. Just stick your head in the sand and just pretend to be normal. Don't be special. Just just hide. And then his only purpose is to serve as a sacrificial lamb, so that so that Kal El doesn't act on what he has to give to the world. And that was one scene where I will be like, I. I like he could is Superman. He could have just absolutely. He, even though Superman. here, let's again spoilers. If you haven't seen the movie, you yet, shouldn't you be listening. Sh- you shouldn't this. be listening. But when we're on Krypton later on, I mean, when we're on Earth later on, one of the many flashbacks. Uh, Cal- You're not well, my dad. Has, you just raised me. <laughs> I'm whiny Clark. They have the fight that many children, I'm sure, uh, adopted children. Yeah, they show that side of it, but they don't show the other side of the it. The loving. So, yeah, they do. He's always looking out for him. When he says, He's like, looking at him to keep him hidden. Oh, shit. There's he's a moment where fucking Kevin Costner, where the kid goes, like, I just can't I just keep being your son? And he's like, you are my son. Like, there was real humanity. There was there. love there, but there wasn't the lessons being taught that, that Jonathan Kent has to teach Clark to make him be the guy he is. 
is. And the was, lesson you felt here was more like hide. Yeah, don't, don't fucking show. show what you can do. Don't For someday. Your own good, someday though. you'll decide who you're going to be, but don't fucking be it now. Just pretend. You know what? You're really good at math. Pretend you're not good at math. You're good at sports. Don't be good at sports. Don't stand out. Don't be anything. Kind of like the dad in The Incredibles. Yeah, that's Let's slow down. That's not the lesson that Jonathan teaches this kid throughout the entirety of his childhood he's got to keep instilling the sacrifice the giving the love of, of others the the sacrifice i mean that that that's what makes him superman right and he's a sour fucking hobo <laughs> through most of that film until no, birth dad not. shows up until birth dad shows up and then he goes home to his mom's like hey mom guess what i found my real dad and everything's cool now and i can't wait to be superman this is going to be great he because doesn't give a shit about anybody until birth dad shows because up. because of what probably what happens with his dad which uh jonathan ken his, his adopted dad uh they're on a highway uh and they get into this argument which is kind of very uncharacteristic but of of the superman we all know which ralph is fighting for Grandpa Ralph will always fight for the old Superman. No, I will fight for the essence of any given character. This is the problem I had with the last Batman movie, and it's the problem I had with this Superman movie, is that don't fix shit that's not broken. Take the best that the story has to offer, build off of that, and make that your focus, and then you can you can embellish and extrapolate and add new flavors and colors to the story, whatever it is. But you have to hold on to the essence of what makes the character the character. And, and that is... It, growing up in that small town in Kansas, he was imbued with the best that um, the American spirit has to offer, mm -hmm. which is caring about other people, putting yourself second in all situations. The only problem Superman should have really emotionally is how does he cope with not being able to save everybody? He right. should be torn to pieces by the fact that he can only do so much because he wants to do so much more. He wants it should to be save. the last fucking ten minutes of Schindler's List. Exactly. Within the, if I wanted this pin, would have saved... Ten more fucking lives. Right. He should be destroyed by the fact that he can't be everywhere all the time because all he wants to do is try to help. That's what I, when I worked on the Superman script, that was the thing I put in his and Lois's relationship because we hit the ground running with we played something in the script about like that she doesn't know who he, she, who he is, but then like we revealed that she totally knows. She plays in the office like she doesn't. They've got a relationship and stuff, but you know his whole thing with her is like I can't. I wish I could be like a husband. I wish we could do this on the regular more right. than we do it now. But he like, can't do that because he doesn't you and belong I go to bowling, one person. You go, you and I go bowling, and like a hundred thousand people in Indonesia are killed by a by a storm. Like I can't not be available to the world. That should that's be his biggest job. source of angst. But that's where we get to in Man of Steel. Like he has to kind of go. But that through kind of this. has to come from the Kents. That 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 seed has to be planted with the Kents. Which which I would argue it is because he clearly cares. He doesn't not care. So obviously he's raised by the Kents and he does want to do good for people and whatnot in the movie. So it, it's but he there spends all that being time seen. being surly, unshaven, but, just looking for hey, his birth he's parents. Not surly. He is way surly. Explain how's he surly? What does he do? He One just, motherfucker pushes him in a barn and he doesn't even fight back. I know, but look at his face when he's not being pushed. Even when he's working on the on the, on the, the fishing boat, he's like, oh, "This is fucking bullshit and everything." He, he doesn't go to college not, apparently. Yet he becomes a stringer for the Daily Planet. He becomes a, a journalist somehow. By the end, but apparently spoilers. he doesn't. Wait, wait, he doesn't go to school or anything. He doesn't better himself. Doesn't go to college. As far as we know, he's just wandering the land. But we don't know. As he an might unshaven, have smelly hobo, just trying to figure out what he's supposed to do with his life. But if the Kents I did disagree. their job, he it's, would know what he's supposed to be doing with his life. It's too literal a reading. He might have gone to college we don't know they don't say like there's no timeline in as much as when we pick up with him the whole adventure you know of the man of steel itself he's 33 years old yeah when he died i know it was very oh. close to yeah, yeah. i heard the moment i heard that i was like the catholic, the catholic school kid in me was like oh how about Jesus when he was, was stretched out in the, in the air floating after in the his father his, his the only says to his only begotten son you can save them all i know the christian in me like really how dug about the that. scene in the church where jesus is over his shoulder in stained glass as he's talking to I the thought priest that was interesting again the young catholic school boy i get me, it seeing, i understand seeing the superman jesus talk to analogy. a priest like that would have been amazing when i was in catholic school i've been like oh my god we got one he's ours <laughs> he's a catholic somehow in the damn the jew creators <laughs> we've taken him for ours um, I would argue that like they just didn't do that stuff in the way they told it in flashback. It enables them to do it in the next movie. You could absolutely be like, "Here's a college scene," but they were just like, "We." His, he watches his dad die. Spo again, fuck, I'm, I'm going to stop saying spoilers because you couldn't, you shouldn't be this deep if you haven't seen it. There's this moment where he's having a fight in a truck and is fucking, you know, with his dad, and he does say something that's not very Clark Kent or Superman, but it is very modern. 
to have a kid talk back to his adopted parents, eventually have that moment of like, "We're you're not my dad or blah, blah, blah. And Kevin Costner plays it wonderfully fucking stung and starts to get a little bit stern. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, as happens in the Midwest, Twister. Right. Now, I'm thinking, as when it happens in the movie, the first thing that rolls through my mind is like, this just happened. Like, didn't it, didn't they just have it in Oklahoma yeah, City? Yeah, devastating. Like, I would have imagined, More if Oklahoma. I'm Warner Brothers, I'm like, oh my God, should we lift this entire fucking sequence? Well, they can't, really. But they can. It's, it's kind of crucial. So it stayed. Nobody seemed to complain about it. So I guess everything kind of works out. So once again, proving you can show something that happened in the real world in a movie, and people don't get upset. They're not like, I mean, we live in a world where Quentin Tarantino, like, fucking killed Hitler. And nobody was like, this is outrageous. They were like, awesome. Yeah. Because it's a movie. That's what people, they're like, we don't expect history or reality from a movie. So in this movie, Twister happens in the Midwest as they happen. And they're, instead of, you know, the previous incarnations of the movie, at least, and they, I think they've done it, in, in, not in the comics, but in the, because he lived in the comics. Yeah. Um, but in the movies and some of the cartoons, Jonathan Kent has a heart attack, succumbs, and, and that's it. Of course, this being not your dad, Superman, no. in a world where jor Al can turn around and fucking knife people and fight and shit like that, Pa Kent's got to go out in a far more dramatic way. And it's he gets sacrificed to the Twister. There's a Twister coming, and following with the philosophy of, like, don't show people your powers or else they'll kill you. There's alien paranoia running throughout the movie. Jonathan Kent's like, if they find out you're not from here... Who knows what they'll do? This is a moment where, you know, he's getting people to an underpass. He saves the dog. For whatever reason, winds up going back to the truck, saves the dog. But Pa Kent gets separated from Ma Kent and, and Clark. And there's this, like, we can see each other moment, which I'll chalk up to Superman having strong vision. Because they're very far apart from each other. Yes. Twister's coming. Pa has been trapped in the truck, and then he finally gets free, but he's, he's not going to get he's free. Hobbled. Oh, he's hobbled. There's yeah. no way he could get away from fucking the, the tornado that's coming. The Twister's coming. And if you're Superman, you could save him. Yes. But he just gives... And it's sad. He gives him this quiet... I don't quite agree with it. I wouldn't have gone this way. Because it's bullshit. <laughs> that's why you don't <laughs> agree with it. It's not bullshit. It's total bullshit. I, I, but Superman's so fast, he could have gotten away with it. But what he does is Jonathan Kent... And again, I'll argue this. They haven't explored the full dimension of his powers yet. So maybe he doesn't know that I could get over there in a lightning's flash and get him out and nobody would even fucking notice. Or what if they, st- what if they did notice? Maybe this is the time now to finally stop pretending you're not special and but his, save your fucking father. But his dad said no. His dad, it was a very sad moment where Kevin Costner no, shakes Keep his hiding. Head. Keep hiding. Because hiding is the most important lesson I will teach you, young Clark, is just pretend not to be special. Don't ever step out he of the norm. He cares about his boy. He doesn't want to see him get hurt. And he knows that like, if, he, if everyone sees Clark save me, like, oh my God, we got the one. One kid shut up about it when on the bus. Pete, Pete Ross, fat Pete, Pete Ross, Ross yeah. yeah. Who I was just like, why couldn't I play Pete Ross? <laughs> why did Zack Snyder call me? I could have played Pete Ross. I would have shaved my beard. Um, but you know, th- there's been a template already. So there's this. I thought it was a really sweet moment. Again, I, it's only when you look at it through the prism of he has not even yet quite learned to fly as he did as he does later on. He knows he's got powers, but it's not. They're not. He hasn't sustained them on a regular basis. He's a younger version of himself. They don't say how old he is, but I'd put him at seventeen, eighteen, or something like that. You know, maybe you buy it that he's just like, all right, I'm gonna do what my dad says and not do what Superman would do, which is go rush over, fucking grab him and whisk him back. Maybe he doesn't know he can do that yet. And so Jonathan Kent gets sucked up by the Twister, and Superman's just like, no. And that is a 21st century comic book move. That, movie, is, a, that move. is an emo bullshit To give move. motivation for like, uh, you know, I've, I've let my dad down. Not only did Jonathan Kent, like in the Superman Richard Donner movie, he's like, come on, Pa, I'll race you. And they're racing back to the house. And that's when Jonathan Kent has his heart attack. Right. So, and think how much more powerful that is in terms of the Superman character. Clark you have, carries you guilt. Have all of these powers. You can do all and these he says things. It. He says it at the graveside. But you couldn't save that person because there's some things, Clark, that are even being Superman are out of your control. And the death of humans by a heart attack or cancer or something else, that's something you have no control over. And that's a lesson in humility for that character. That's so much more an important lesson, I think, learned than for him just to choose not to save his own father because his father wants him to hide his light under a bushel. I thought that if you want to be real and you want to show something that's dramatically powerful, the lesson learned, which is... You can't save everybody, 
is a devastating thing that he'll have to carry with him forever versus just the guilt of I chose not to save my father in that twister. I think he's going to learn that lesson in the third act. You can't save everybody during all those fights in the building. Well, he doesn't give a shit about saving anybody in those fights. He just takes takes down buildings and 7-Elevens and Sears's and IHOPs and other corporate sponsors throughout the film that he just doesn't even think twice about anybody until they're about to be cut in half with heat vision in a subway train station. But doesn't it... And then he does the ultimate Superman act, which, of course, is to murder someone. Which he did, though, once before. He did in Superman 2. He kills Zod. Zod falls to his death. By Superman. Falls to his death. Yeah. But he doesn't snap his fucking neck. He, well, he's got it, and they justify it, because he's just like... I won't stop until this planet is. I will kill everybody. I will, you know, Zod makes it very clear that he won't just say uncle and quietly go back. Like now that the, the spoil, we're way out of spoiler territory, and the, the Phantom Zone projector is fucking gone. He's trapped on Earth and shit. And he's just like, I spend the rest of my life just fucking killing everybody here. Fucking, you know, because that's my programming. That's my recreate Krypton, save Krypton, blah, blah, blah. And then Superman eventually is just like, I gotta, and, and I gotta make the move, and he fucking snaps his neck, and like in every, I think, like in so many moments where it takes a lot of strength in this movie, he yells, doesn't he? Yeah. He's like, ah, he which is after, sad. I thought it was fucking, him. yeah, I thought yeah. it was sad because he's like, this is the only other person like him. He absolutely chooses Earth over a Krypton. I mean, we're jumping all over the place, and the reason he chooses Earth over Krypton is. Because Krypton, like, you know, Zod isn't just like, let's fly off into space together and chill out. He wants to recreate Krypton on the bones of Earth. There's a really cool fucking sequence where Superman, Zod invades a dream and just explains to him what the plan is. And the plan is Earth will be the new Krypton. We will terraform it. You know, we can, they can't breathe. That's one of the things that they bring to the movie. Like when the Kryptonians land on the planet, they've got to wear containment breathers, suits yeah. and breathers so that they can live in our environment because they're not used to living under Earth's yellow sun. Clark is. And through flashbacks, they tell the story in a way we haven't really seen it done in many other places in large media before, in the comics many times. But little Clark has to deal with his powers. Like, you know, uh, he's here he is, this Kryptonian kid on Earth. They have this sequence of him in a classroom and Everything unfiltered is hitting. I loved them. that scene, by the way. I thought it was such great. a beautiful scene. It and it's like every piece of sound, every piece of. He's looking at kids and seeing their skeletons and muscles, right. and the kid is fucking freaking out because he's terrified. He's a little child. And he runs out of the fucking room into a closet. I was hoping they would reveal it was a lead lined closet, <laughs> but they didn't. But he's there and trapped. His mom has a great moment with him. I loved that moment. Ma Kent, Diane great. Lane comes in and she's like, you know, uh, make the world. He's like, it's too big. And she's like, make the world small. And she teaches him. See, I get emotional about this shit. If you hear my voice, make it an island. Swim towards it. Yes. Yeah. And it's, that's beautiful. That See? kind of stuff was what was lacking in the relationship with Pa Kent as much. She was more the tetherer nurturer. than She was him. the nurturer. Yeah, and absolutely. he was more the fucking realist of like, they'll fucking He's a coward. You. He's a fucking coward. Jonathan <laughs> Kent is a fucking coward in this movie. <laughs> He's not a coward. He cares shit. about his son. He's no. A piece of shit. He cares about his son. He we're so, wants we're lucky that he becomes super meth addict after having a father he, like that. I identify with this Jonathan Kent because I'm always saying, my kid goes out, I'm like, take something stabby and fucking never leave the house and try not to go to college. Like, I'm always trying to insulate and keep her away right. from... That's and why she's we're lucky kal didn't land on your farm That's because true. you <laughs> would have raised a fucked up Superman. But Jonathan Kent is better than that. I would have been like, you know what's he better He puts than his use, own fears aside in order to do... Powers? To know that his son was meant for something special. So he puts his own fears aside and teaches his son to be a, a, a savior, teaches his son to be the hero that we all need. Which we have. Except we've Zack had, Snyder and Christopher Nolan. They don't need that hero. We've had years they need their meds but up. They don't do that in this day and age, man. Like but now, that's the thing. You, you can't be. This character can't be responsible for this day and age. He can't be responsible for the fact that we're the whole all fucked job up. is to bring him into this day and age and make him believable. The problem with like Superman Returns, if you read over and over again, is people going like, "This character just doesn't work because nobody cares about these things in a post nine eleven world." But people don't care about values and shit like that. See, we're all I would scared argue, of fucking the outsider. We're all scared of fucking right, like exactly. calamity and whatnot. We and don't so have I it. would argue that we need that character more than ever because because of the situation we live in, because of the fear and the fact that everyone is cynical and everyone else has has put that that veneer of callousness on their personalities and their hearts and their souls. We need more than ever a pure form of that character that we can hold up and say this is the ideal. This is what we want to strive to be. This is the light that comes out of all the darkness that we're surrounded by. Don't dim the light. 
raise up the rest of it. You know what I mean? But I would argue that's what happens by the end of the movie. Like, whereas in the Dick Donner version, we get that early. He hits the ground running by the hour mark. His mission is in place. I'm going to be the guy in the suit and be the. the and I'm not saying everybody. Donner's version plays in, in this day and age. I'm saying that there is a. There, you take what is effective and is necessary for the character, and then you build whatever layers of modern society you want to on top of that. I thought they, they, they tinkered with the essence of the character to the point where it did it a detriment. And they surrounded it with a lot of a lot of spaceships fighting and stuff. There was a lot of science fiction alien aspects of it too that detracted from what I thought a Superman story should be. But I think that was the aim. I think the idea was they were like, "Look, we can't do a superhero movie. They do superhero movies left and right. They're like, well, how do you do this story in a war, a post Batman, post Iron Man world? Like we've now seen hipper permutations than the than the the little kid who grows up in kansas who becomes like the they gotta they gotta make it palatable to this generation that's watched the avengers get together and and fight and so i guess that just doesn't play to the kids because this opened 115 million look of course and i'm not saying it's not gonna make a ton of a ton of money i'm just saying i think it missed the mark and you know i have problems with this film honestly i liked it I thought it was fine. I mean, I didn't dislike it. I didn't right. actively hated it. But I just thought there were missed opportunities. And so much of it struck me as hubris. Like the creators of the film saying, oh, well, that's what Superman used to be? Okay, well, I'm going fu- to fucking change it. Because this is my Superman now. And I don't give a shit about what that character is or was. I'm going to just randomly tinker with shit because it, this, I'm going to put my stink all over it. And the ego of that and the hubris of that seemed to permeate this film a lot to me. Again, it was like that interview I read where he said, I'm not putting red briefs on my Superman because this Superman is in the real world. As if the red briefs one way or the other would change whether this character was in the real world or not. It's just people changing shit for the sake of changing it sometimes. Which happens, that's what's happened in comics for years. John Byrne, I mean, Superman is what he is because he constantly gets changed by the hands of whatever artist is handling but at the time. And those elements it. that you talk about, the Pa Kent of it all and stuff, that wasn't even present in the first permutation. That came along later on. It was probably solidified far more in the movie than they ever really did in the comics. You know, I mean, they have plenty of time in the comics, but of course you don't see it as uh, as as concentrated as you did in the relationship in those few scenes, and they were a few scenes, like yeah, not even not much. It's maybe two. That's why max. it's Jor El's film. He's the hero. He's the one who comes in and teaches Superman how to be Superman. And I just said, "Well, he's dead. Let him be dead. Let that." That's an important part of the thing too. Is the is the longing that Superman has for his long lost dead parents? But he's he always had the contact too in the Superman movie. He goes the, for, the into the Antarctic for whatever reason. They he, never he, quite he, explain. He goes drifting there as well. Yeah. In the Dick Donner one, he just doesn't have a beard and he doesn't look as surly. He looks confused and that's why you're like, I'm okay with that. But the guy, the other guy, is on a fishing trip and you're like, fuck this prick. He's the same thing. He goes strolling. He doesn't know who he is. He goes. But he's he's, he's drawn by that. But that, he, that but Cal crystal, as well. Why. He's he's looking for something. And he's still got this. And, and, and he's and, also searching. Like when we meet Cal on the boat, uh, the impression is he's been going through life being this hidden angel for people. Like doing these jobs. Trying to find something, and then he gets a bead on a government line about some spaceship that's been found in the Antarctic and shit. That finally draws him there. To be fair, that's a better reason than in the Dick Donner version. He just goes walking in Antarctica, and he throws the fucking crystal for no reason. And that grows the Antarctic wonderland that is the Fortress Fortress of Solitude, which echoes Krypton. Inside the fortress, and then he gets Jor-El. a pre-recorded list of wisdom that that Jor-El recorded. Same for his son. thing here. Like, no, the, here it's like, oh hi Lois, how you doing? Nice, I'm Jor-El. Nice to meet you. Yes, I it's can interact with you because well, I have an entire personality in this crystal, and I'm I'm here even though I'm I'm dead many years but ago. That's fair. That's 21st century technology. It's a cheat. It's, yeah, it's allowing like the cheat. character c- to continue being a major role in the film, even though he dies Kryptonian in the first reel. technology would allow oh, you to imprint boy. your Isn't personality. That Isn't that convenient? It's weird that they didn't do it for Lara, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, it, it, I, I buy that. That doesn't jump for me. There are moments, too, that I was like, ooh, shit. Like on Krypton, they had the little robots. Um, there were robot centurions at the Fortress of Solitude. Uh, there, that was another moment where I was sitting there watching the movie going... Wow, there's a fucking robot centurion, just like we had in our script. Yeah. The, the fucking thing he fights at the end sure looks like a fucking giant spider with tentacles and same fucking idea. And at one point, when you first see the fucking Fortress of Solitude, the ship that they uncover in the Antarctic, he flies it off. They find it deep in the ice. He flies it to some mountain peak or whatever. 
It's a fucking polar bear walking around. Those are the moments where I was just like, uh, either some, either fucking somebody's doing a Kurt Swan wink at me, or John Peters was fucking I serious, and he was like, "I've been working on this shit for almost twenty years. I'm getting those three fucking elements." He didn't get a spider, but he got something damn close. But uh, the um, he he goes and finds this fucking ship. It's kind of a quasi fortress of solitude. He's been on, I feel been on a quest for who the fuck am I? Just like in the other movie. Same idea. He finds the technology. The technology starts talking to him. Here it's a little more advanced, as we pointed out, than than it was with Marlon Brando. It was just kind of pre-recorded of every possible question you could ever ask. So much so that in Superman Returns, they return to the Forge of Solitude. Lex Luthor fucking controls the panel right. and says, show me everything. So that jor couldn't really differentiate either. No, it was just a message. It was a pre-recorded message from beyond. That's what that was. This one, though, is a oh. computer. Hi, that's Lois. Just like- you're, you're very attractive with your red hair because I'm a computer, but I can also be real. And here <laughs> I am. But it made for fun shit, like where he's like, behind you, duck. And he could coach you. Yeah. Fun isn't necessarily a good enough reason to put everything in a movie. Oh, in a movie, all we're going to do is escape. We're not looking for the fucking human condition. But in if, Man it's of Steel. A, if it detracts, we're looking to from be like. Some, I would argue after Superman Returns, a lot of us are like, just show them fucking punch someone through a building. I'm all for times. that. I'm and all they for do that. A hundred, and, and they do a hundred times. And in that's where minutes. maybe people are like, well, you know, wow, that's that's a lot. But here's what you said. He's looking for who he is. My my contention is that Clark Kent Superman knows who he is. Long before the real the, the the character's nature dictates that he knows who he is because he is formed by those experiences with that family in Kansas before he becomes a man. He's already a fully formed person. That is who he is. The Krypton stuff is all additional information, but he's got to know who he is and what he stands for by the time he leaves that farm because of that family. But and I what would they argue gave that him. the that 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 was written in a simpler time. And what we've heard from most people who you know, there's lots more literature and people talking about the adoptive process. There are people that get to a point where it's just like, okay, I know who I am because of my environment and who raised me and blah, blah, blah. But like, I'll never know who I am until I find that missing piece. And so even though he's the person that the Kents raised... And in they this raised instance, a hobo. That's what they raised. He's not a, a fucking hobo. hobo. He's a hobo. Then he's a hobo in the Dick Donner version because he goes hoboing up to Antarctica for no fucking reason. None. There's no like, son, the truth the is Crystal in Antarctica. tells him to go there. Oh, now that's so he's got a magic fucking flute and that's more fucking viable. Well, it's better than Jarrell coming back to life. Like, howdy doody is a puppet and he's like able that. to help everybody. But he's drawn to Antarctica because he hears about a spaceship and he knows his dad told him spaceship back in the day, as is with every permutation or incarnation of the character. Sooner or later, Pa Kent goes and pulls a tarp off a fucking rocket ship and goes, this is how we found you and stuff. And there's a touching scene in this movie. Like the Kevin Costner stuff, he's almost like playing the grown-up version of like himself from Field of Dreams. Yeah. Like you expect him after he fucking like, as the tornado takes him away, like Clark sees him walking out of the cornfield. Want to play some ball, Dad? Want to play a catch? Want to have a catch? Which is the... Fucking even just mentioning that moment sends shivers down my spine. If if you're a man and you want to induce tears instantly, yeah. especially on Father's Day. Oh God, which it is. That's yeah. maybe that's what I'll do. I'll force my wife to watch Field of Dreams. Like you got to watch this. And I'm not even a baseball fan. That, you don't have that, to that, movie, be that movie, you don't have to. It makes you. It's really a father and son story. And the fucking ending. You take this beautiful trip just to get to. A, you know, a fucking Father's Day moment, like yeah. the ultimate father-son fucking moment. Oh, God, I'm going to cry talking about it. In any event, it, Ray Kinsella, that was his name. Yeah. He's almost like, he's less Jonathan Kent, more Ray Kinsella. Um, but even Ray Kinsella was like, you should go for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jonathan Kent is like, shh, shh, no, just go, just go sit see, down. Just go that? sit there and don't do anything. Maybe why I appeal, why he appeals to me is he's like my dad. Because <laughs> like my dad was, was like, see that mountain? Never climb it. Don't climb it. <laughs> That's Jonathan Kent. Um, so, uh, the, the, when he's, when he gets to the ship, at least when he gets to Antarctica, where he goes looking in Antarctica, it makes sense. Lois Lane, conversely, has been following these stories or she gets saved. That's why she hasn't followed stories. She's been following the story of like this, maybe there's a ship in Antarctica. And while she's on the journey to it, that's where she meets Superman. Correct. Like, yeah, they cross paths. She's not looking for him. But then all of a sudden afterwards, she starts writing about him and mm-hmm. trying to find how, or at yeah. least they make it seem like she's writing pieces. I think so. And then she starts looking, tracks him down in like two days. Yeah. You know, that whole rich uh, tapestry of the three-way relationship <laughs> between Clark and Lois and Superman, that love triangle. Let's take that in this 
pitch it out the fucking window and let's Come have her on. figure out That's who he so is. so tough to do. In, in, in real two, let's have her figure that out who is Superman a, is. A, a, That's another look, moment. Like, oh, so Lois Lane's always trying to figure out who Superman is. Fuck that. This is my Superman. She's got to find out in the first reel That's who he not is. Even and then him, we're, we're going to. That is a rem. Even the one I wrote, as I said before, she knew from the stump, start because you can't have it both ways. That is the bygone era, a product of a bygone era where two old guys in the fucking 40s were like, She's a reporter who's not fucking smart enough to figure out that the guy in glasses is the guy she's in love with because, eh, she's a woman. But the unrequited love, the anymore. unrequited love that Clark Kent has for Superman, for Lois, that isn't, isn't given back to him, right. is another element that isolates him as a character. It's a great, I know, it's a but great how aspect play, that isolates him as a character. But you can't play the other beat of, I'm a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and I'm looking right in your fucking face and sometimes your glasses get knocked off. And I still can't make the leap to like, oh, you're the the guy who I talked to. It's not even like well, I saw don't him from have a her fight aliens with him in the third reel. Then <laughs> it creates some distance between those characters, so that can still play out. You don't, you're not forced, but to it's make never going to play out because she's going to be all right. So if she doesn't realize that the fucking dude she ran into on the ship right. is the dude in the cape, he she's going like, to be like, he's from the same race. These Kryptonian people who just showed up because Zod will tell us in twenty minutes. All of America, all of the world. I am General Zod. I'm here for Kal El. Blah blah blah. So even at that point, like she's gonna figure out. Like I bet you that dude here is the dude who's fucking been saving people as well. Right, like, but she doesn't have to find out he's Clark Kent. She doesn't have to hunt him down and have an emotional meeting in the graveyard. But that's, but that's what a Pulitzer Prize winning fucking reporter would do. Which is like, I met a human being who could fucking saved my life. Who. Burned a laser hole, uh, corduroys my wounds on on a fucking spaceship that he knew how to drive. So clearly, this guy is this fuck. And the Clark Kent aspect of it, like your next question is like, who is this person? Where did he come from? I've heard from this General Zod declaration that he's been amongst us forever. So as a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, your next fucking five steps are going to be like, all right, he's been hiding somewhere all this time. Let's find out. And she did it. She tracked it down. Like that's the real world in the internet age. You can't have fucking Lois Lane sit there going like, well, Clark, I sure love Superman. Can you get me some coffee? Like, it just makes her seem stupid. So you make a version where she's got to find out right away. And then all of a sudden, yes, you're right. I, I agree. You lose the aspect of like, she loves him, but she doesn't love him, which I always fucking thought, thought makes her shallow. Like, the fact that Lois Lane sits there and is like, oh, my God. I would fucking let him put his balls over my eyes. I'd Roman face mask the fuck out of me. Superman is a, a god. I'd suck dick. I love him. Clark is the exact same person who's even nicer to her all the time. Always going out of his way for her. same body build. Um, same concern for humanity that Superman has. And yet she's just like, oh, Clark, you're just Clark. But Superman on the other hand, I always felt that made her shallow. At least yeah. to have her well, go. Well, some like, people are shallow. You know, you want reality. <laughs> you want reality in some aspects. Says but you the want the king of death. <laughs> but you want you want Lois to be oh uh, this wonderful woman who just loves everyone equally. And it's, why no, can't she feisty. be a little bit shallow? Feisty means smart as well. Yes, usually. it does. So smart right away. If you're going to have but her, smart can also be self involved and can also be. She uh, can't be a reporter. Then it falls apart. It, it, if the moment she's, I mean, that's why it worked in the charming time of the early fucking aunt. 40s 50s going 75 years back because that was the political climate like women were in the kitchen and fucking dudes did shit and like of course women can't figure things out but she's still shallow because she meets him three times she meets him when he cauterizes her wound yes at the at the which uh, immediately you fall in love with the man like in, in the midst of a crisis somebody who saves your fucking life that's florence nightingale right then and there i, I buy that relationship because she's like this dude is like this dude saved my life he saves her life multiple times, including that fucking beautiful moment that we've all seen in the TV spots where he's rushing her away from fucking the, the whatever it is, that fucking exploding world. And, the, and she is looking back over his arms in like utter terror of yes. like, oh, my God. That's a great moment. It, that is, that's what you dream about when you dream about a superhero moment. Like, I understand what you're talking about in terms of like, let's give him the human grounding. But we've had, we're in a different age. Like, most people are like, that's. We all care about people. That's given. Like, and, and the idea of like a father being like, put everything before you, it, it, it doesn't make sense anymore. Especially I, having been raised in a household of like my, my parents, my mother was Catholic as the day is long, dude, and went to church every Sunday. I remember I used this phrase in the world and somebody was like, ew, but my mother would say it all the time. Charity begins at home. Like, that's the mindset of most fucking people, which is like, I don't care how special you are. I'm, you're talking to a dude 
who when he told people like, I want to be a filmmaker, most people were like, why don't do that? You'll fail. So it's more human, more believable to have a Jonathan Kent who's just like, don't fucking tell anybody. They will kill you. You're an alien. I, I have the fucking rocket ship. That to me plays more as 21st century. And I understand like some things are lost, but some things have to be lost in order for the character to like soar in the present age. In order for him to go from being like a corporate icon to a viable fucking character, some of the, you know, corny or some people call it corny or the, the elements that you and I consider human or that we were raised on have to fall away for a fucking mindset that's just like, I, I can't deal with this. If I can't deal, if Lois Lane doesn't figure out he's Superman in two fucking minutes as an ace reporter, she's not an ace reporter. And she's also dumb. And since she's got to be the woman who represents all of femaledom in the Superman mythos, you know, I mean, to take part of take aside Lana Lang uh, early in his life in right. Smallville. Lois Lane raps, I'm every woman. She got to be every woman. If her defining fucking aspect is, I'm too fucking dumb to realize the guy in front of me is the guy I'm in love with, and I'm too fucking shallow to be in love with the guy who's in front of me, regardless of the guy I'm in love with who's up in the sky. That's not a relatable character for a, for a lot. And definitely there's like the sex and city people who are like, well, of course, that's the way to but for most women, it's alienating. My wife has no interest in going to see fucking Man of Steel because she's like, man of steel. And, and you know, the aspect of, as she's seen represented in the past of like, oh, Lois, and he's got to rescue Lois every fucking two seconds. And Lois is this supposed to be a smart reporter but can't figure out he's fucking Superman. Just leaves him cold and stuff. So for this day and age, they got to make her smart. They got to make I her figure it out I can respect that argument, and I can give you that. But I... I I would still argue that given the opportunity that you have with a character like Superman, you don't have to make him like the rest of us. You don't have to make that family like the rest of us. You don't have to make him, uh, you have to let him wallow in the weakness and the, and the pettiness of modern day American society. You can raise him above that and make him better than that. That's the gift you're given because he's not from here. He's, he's, it's a fantasy character. He can represent better than what, ever modern days reflect on a film you can you have the opportunity to take him and raise that character above and beyond the the the, the failings and the weakness that everybody seems to have in our society and you can make him better than that and then people go cold that's what they did in superman returns but like, superman returns he iconic. was he was worse than us he wasn't better than <laughs> us he was worse than us he was sadder than he us. was he was a whiny <laughs> petty uh, creepy, stocky. He was. He was much worse a character than than than, than uh, the Dick Cavill's. You know, even the, the Cavill's Cavill character one. is in this one. Man. I'm not saying you go back to Superman Returns as a template to make a successful Superman. But that's movie what. At all. But I think, and I'm believe me, I'm not saying uh, that's. But that is the reason this happened. Like Man of Steel is what it is as almost a direct response to the Dark Knight trilogy to what happened with Superman Returns last time and where the ball lays currently. Like Tony Stark. We love him, but you know he's kind of coarse, and and he's not like he's not like Chris Reeves Superman. No, but Tony Stark as a character isn't like Superman, right? You know, he's an alcoholic. He's he's a he's a petty playboy. I mean, he's got a lot of issues. Always has, always will be. I mean, that's the nature of that character. The Boy Scout nature of Superman, like it or don't, is quintessential to that character. And if you're gonna do a fucking Superman movie, you have to pay a little homage. To what that character is, in my opinion. I would if you want to do something, there, you want to make a though. modern, you want to do superior or do another incarnation of a superpowered being and make it be flawed and, and, and weak and horrible and stuff, there's plenty of those to choose from. But if you're going to make a Superman movie, do a Superman movie. That's my would be my contention. I'm, I'm with you, and I think in a perfect world that's true, but I think you've got to play the ball where it lays. And where the ball lays right now is you're in a post-Avengers world. Marvel's kicking ass. They've done single character stories. They're doing business with characters like fucking Thor, which nobody even thought was possible and stuff like and that. And I think the successful formula Marvel has that DC hasn't followed is that they have... Levity? Levity, a I, sense of joy. I a agree. sense of joy. Not even levity, because you don't want to force comedy into a situation that doesn't necessarily play. But there's a sense of wonder and, and lightness and joy about those films 
that harkens back earnest. harkens back to a Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of vibe. I mean, something that's an adventure that gets you caught up in the spirit of that. It taps into Dude, your inner hark- child. It harkens and gives back you, to Dick Donner's Superman. Yes, like, it gives that's you a what sense of wonder and joy about these characters while also basing it in a relatable reality. It's not exactly real. No, of course not. But it has even uh, Captain America had that too. I thought that there's a he's an anachronistic sort of uh, good guy in a world full of not so good guys and that's what sets him apart from Iron Man and from the sullen in, Bruce in Captain Banner America, and all these other... you get the beauty of oh yeah but he ain't from now of course he's this character and he and he's not this from way, here but this, he's from 1940. this guy's not from here but he was raised in currently in this in this incarnation of Man of Steel he was raised uh, if he's 33 for the last 33 years in Kansas in current day American Kansas yes. not 19 fucking 40s or 50s Kansas and I say Kansas still some good people in it. In the I absolutely agree, but now, also just because you of, hate Kansas, Kevin, there's no reason your, for your you mind. to pick on my perspective. Speaking of Kansas, I recently put this together in, uh, in my head. Like I've played this theater in Kansas called the Kansas City Midland uh, Theater. We've done a, a few times. I've done it by myself. Done it with Jay and Silent Bob. Get old. Um, it's great old theater. I just realized recently. I put it together, and I wasn't even there on stage, but I was just like sitting home thinking about Man of Steel because I saw Man of Steel. Um, at the, let me say, at the, probably the Middletown uh, movies, mi- movies at Middletown, if not the Shrewsbury uh, Trio Cinema at the time when it came out in 1978, where I grew oh, up. Oh, not Man of Steel. You said Man of Steel. Superman. Super- I'm talking about Superman back okay. in the day. So the next time I saw it, I was on a family vacation. We were on a train going cross country, and we got to. Clark Kent was running next to it. And you looked, fucking, the I looked out the window, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> um, and I, he smiled and winked at me, and I was like, now that's fucking human. This kid's going to grow up to be something. That's a good kid. That's not not a, a hobo. Building smashing goddamn hobo. <laughs> he's not going to go fishing, and he's not going to swill booze for losers in some Alaskan bar. He's not a hobo. He's a um, hobo. The, uh, I'm on this train, and at one point, as we get to Kansas City, I guess they told, they, they, at the point, at that point, I don't think they said, Native Americans, they came over the loudspeaker and said, uh, we're going to have to stop here. Indians have burnt logs on the track up ahead in protest, so uh, we can't go forward. We're going to be stuck here for the night in Kansas City, and they gave us money. I called my mom to confirm this. She was like, yeah, they gave us like $100 because we had five people, me, the, my parents and the three kids, and uh, to spend the evening in Kansas City. And we went to see Superman, even though oh, I'd wow. seen it before and shit. And we went to see Superman. And now I'd grown up around multiplexes or uh, triplexes, no grand old movie houses. This is grand old movie house in Kansas City. And I remember walking down these palatial stairs. It looked like unlike any other movie theater I've ever been in my life. And then the movie starts in like one three three format with the action comic cover yeah, yeah. and then pulls out in the opening credits. And it was late in the run, so the place was kind of empty. And it was just me and my family. Watched it, loved it, even though I'd seen it before and stuff. And this was the days, you know, you you went to the movie once. If you were lucky, you went maybe twice. And you didn't have it on video for fucking years and years because there was no goddamn video and stuff. I just realized that was the Kansas City Midland Theater. So not only have I sat in that fucking audience as a child, years later I returned. I've been on that stage many, many, many times. In the time, in the cross streams of time, somewhere I'm sitting there looking at the stage and somewhere else I'm fucking standing on the stage. But You're the, a looper. I am. You, a, you completed your loop. If I could only come in my face, I'd be a looper. Um, oh, hey, little kid. Come, well, what is that? <laughs> Blast. Oh, my God. That's who you fucking are. That's who you'll be your whole life. Um, I remember seeing that in that theater, and I remember that movie, of course, very well, and we keep hearkening back to it. It's definitely worth a relook and stuff, but so much of that shit you can't even pull off today, man. Like, it's classic. It's timeless, but not timeless enough where people are like, let's try it, and we only know this. Because they just did it seven but years I'm ago. But I'm saying they didn't. That they Superman did that. Returns movie isn't the movie I'm saying to make. But it harkens to all. Like when you watch it, it fits very well within that. Uh, you know, the Dick Donner canon. Oh, I beg to differ. I think it's, it's watch it, leaps dude. and bounds. I just watched it. It's beyond I'm, I'm not the saying, Dick Donner oh, canon. Me, I'm not whatsoever. saying it's uh, it's as good as Dick Donner. But uh, Superman Returns. Well, I'm not saying try to same, make another chapter from the Dick sequel, Donner movies. Yeah, yeah. Don't make a sequel. Reboot it, but keep some of the hopeful, I'm joyful elements in it that make the character the character. I'm Look, with you, but that's what they... made him scared. I think they were like, oh, it's too colorful. His outfit looks the exact same. It's too joyful. It's too. He's a fucking Boy Scout. 
Like they got to they they can't they got to butch him up a little bit. That's what it felt like. Man of Steel was just like, and that's why I thought the the thing at the end, the bit where he does with the drone, he says, "I'm I'm here to help you, but it has to be on my terms." I mean, give him that quality. Give him sort of a no nonsense. He has to get there. It's an origin quality. story. I like, know it's an origin. That's story. why when I keep saying it's Batman Begins, Batman Begins, like I liked Batman Begins very earnest, but I was never when it came out, I would never think of it as like, oh, it's one of my favorite films of all time. I was like, wow, that's a very serious take to, uh, on, on Batman. That's what this is. Like, wow, but, this but is a very Batman serious isn't thing. Superman. That's what I'm saying. I agree, but they if you put apply him through the Batman, the Batman filter. filter onto Superman, you diminish what the character is. Not, but it, it worked. Like everybody went. Like it looks like it's probably going to. If you're judging a whether a movie bucks. works or not by how much money it makes, then Adam Sandler is the funniest man on the planet. <laughs> but that's all they care about. At the end of the day, I I know they've, that's what they care about. That's rebooted. not what I care about, Kevin. But think about this. Let's now talk that about they've what we care about. Let's all right. But let's. But what I care about is seeing more fucking. This is what I care about. Justice League movie. So every step that gets us closer to that is important and 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 good. So if this opens 115 million, guess what? We are fucking one step closer. And I agree. The elements you're talking about would have been would have made it better for you and me and shit. But that's not what matters at the end of the day. What matters is did they do enough business that they're going to do it again and not just fucking end it like they did last time. And they did. They took the step forward. And it's like one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I'd prefer they would have done this, this. Shit, I'd have preferred they'd done my script if we're talking about a world of preference. But in the one we got, I'm like, thank God it did what it was supposed to do. Apparently fucking people are excited about fucking Superman again, which when the last one came out, people were like, Oh yeah, cool. Cause it's retro. Cause it looks like the old stuff and even the way they presented it. And it kind of looks quasi fifties and, but there was no hype and stuff. And then it just kind of came and went pretty quickly. We're living in a world now where this opens to 115, man. It'll probably go to 300, probably do a billion at least worldwide. That means we're one step closer to fucking Justice League. That means the next movie, since this is all set up, and if you're following the Nolan Batman Begins formula, then the next Superman movie is the will Dark be the good Knight. one. The, yeah, which I'm like, you know, look, I like this one. Unfortunately, it bears the burden of having to be an origin story. But fortunately, it doesn't handle it the way most origin stories does. It f- fucks around with the timeline, so you're constantly engaged there's never five minutes without an action sequence it is the antithesis of what superman returns was and i think that's what a lot of people are responding to like fuck yeah man this is superman superman's back and even though people like you and i who are like look i know superman and you know they could be a lot closer to superman we got you know you got to play the ball where it lays here's the thing it has going for it is that henry cavill is an enormously charming good looking really talented good. actor and he's great chiseled as fuck without he's a great superman on. the cast in this thing i think across the board was perfect i really enjoyed all of the casting i think that is got that was the strength that really made it a better film than even it is quite frankly i think they're saddled with a lot of baggage that comes from Nolan and from Snyder, who I don't think is a great storyteller, by the way. I think Zack Snyder has always been very visually entertaining like and has a Watchmen lot to go lot, on, though. has a lot going for him. But when it comes to character arc and story and that kind of stuff, I think sometimes he falls short. But I think the cast really pulls this movie through in a lot of spots where it could have bogged down. And so I just see it more as a missed opportunity right. than than as a failure. But I'm hoping that the next one, with the success of this film, will be a little bit more Superman, a little less Independence Day. And if you fi- yeah, and if you figure it's, it's so weird that you pull the uh, Roland Emmerich analogy because I never really thought about that, but that is kind of the birth of the building exploding movie, right then yeah. and there. Um, I I loved it. I mean, I, I'm not like, whoa, this is fucking one of my top ten films. But I I was fully engaged. I mean, I will totally give you that the last like twenty minutes that fight goes on. Um, I was not like, oh fuck, Zod didn't get sucked in by the Phantom Generator. I just didn't realize we were going to go for another fight, and I was like, all right, yeah, this makes sense. They got a fight. But that fight goes on for a little while. And it, but again, it ain't made for us in a video game generation. I guarantee you, fucking kids love that. They're just like fucking. Look, dude, I can watch Superman punch the shit out of people, make him do it myself with my game controller. So on the big screen, you better show me something that I can't see. And I think they're kind of working toward those cats, man. And like I, I, I was in an audience where cats were like fucking woo after the movie, and I've read a lot of people on Twitter talking about like people cheering. So. They must be doing something right. And I think people are just happy Superman's back, too. Like, so am I. And, and, and uh, yeah, and believe me, I'm not demonizing your, you at all. I, I get what you're saying. But I'm just like one of these cats where I was engaged. I liked what they did with the beginning. I, I liked that they fucked up the timeline. Um, I, every time I was like, but Superman needs to, I go, this is an origin story. 
So I understand by the end of this movie, he better be fucking Superman. The Superman I'm looking for and know. And I felt like by the end he was. In the moment where he's talking to the general about, like, fuck your drones. You know, I'm here to help, but I, ain't, I don't work for you and stuff like that. You saw everything come together for him to be Superman. That's the other thing we should point out. Barely anyone. Super, the word Superman is said once in the whole movie. Amy Adams almost says it, right. but there's a, a lower down the line. Some John, lieutenant or something. It says that's what they're calling him. How'd they pick him? I have no idea. That was a plum spot for anybody. A cameo, just fucking something. <laughs> yeah. But it was just some random guy says uh, Superman's on his way, and he goes, "What?" Someone else goes, "What?" And he goes, "That's that's, that's what, what they're, they're calling, calling him." him. Yeah. So, in a movie where you know it's all about leading up to the moment where apparently somebody else you know the name the legend begins in these comic book movies apparently nobody could ever be like and i shall be called this <laughs> it's always given you by somebody else except for batman usually a reporter yeah yeah that's true no, the uh, cops call him batman right the batman but not in the, the current one right like i don't know if he dictates it himself because alfred no. goes why bats Malf uh, master bruce and it's not like he's like what will people call you like there's no conversation about like I will be Batman. I thought but the in cops the other called one, him the Batman. In, but the, in the new incarnation. What I know Robert himself. Wall did it, uh, I think. In, in, in the 89 in the one, 89. it was the, yeah, the it, papers dubbed him Batman. Yeah. But what would he have been calling himself that whole time? Like, it, it's one thing if you're like, I'm, I'm fighting a war on crime, but you pick a motif of the bat. Clearly, you know, bat soldier or the fucking vengeful bat, the bat. He had bat in mind. So yeah. even if he didn't go batman but i think he did they never cleared that up looking forward to eight years of retirement man i think is what he called himself <laughs> franchise. this one though bad knee man superman is is uttered by somebody you get the, the s stands for hope yes. that's what he says in the movie well how about showing us fucking that then Zack snyder if the s stands for hope how about, it doesn't stand for hobo does it does the s stand for hobo on his chest it's not a hobo sullen dude. hobo if anything he's a drifter but he's no more or less a hobo than the beardless version of himself and the dick donner version who goes hiking in the Antarctic for no reason other than like I gotta go find myself and I feel bad because I had a foot race with my dad and he died so there is guilt there same thing that he's got going on but he's not responsible for his father's death in that one but he feels that he is because he's like I'll race you he feels helpless yeah but he also I I would argue that you carry like fuck if I didn't race this guy up the hill if I didn't even and he wasn't like super speeding it he was just doing a normal human jog it's different than watching a twister lift your dad into oblivion while your dad is saying no stay there hi don't be special. <laughs> I don't know. Be I a loser it. like everyone else, Clark. That's what we want you to be. I would argue that, that Jonathan Kent. that's the human perspective. Like, it's if a anything, bad human perspective. If anything, what they could have done was up the quotient of, Di of Di is Diane Lane? Yes, Diane Lane. Diane Lane and let her be more of the nurturer that we got to see in the flick as the one. Like, if, she's, if he's not getting those values from Jonathan Kent, if Jonathan Kent is playing the you got a hide card, the other mother parent has to be like, no, no, push, push. Otherwise, you got two parents going, do nothing. Right. So it, maybe then they you should have, have played super up Kevin her. Smith. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never in so much. Don't even make a film. Like just sit there. <laughs> Clark, <laughs> Clark ends up just smoking weed in his house as a human and doing a podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. That's a watchable movie. <laughs> I'd be behind that. And if it costs two hundred and twenty-five million, I'd be nuts. That's what the weird thing is. This movie costs two hundred twenty-five million. Less than fucking Superman Returns, and more happens in this movie than ever ha than happens in all of more happens in the first eighteen minutes of this movie than happens in all of Superman Returns. Yes. Like the Krypton shit is just like in your fucking face and won't stop. And one of the big things we should talk about that they really deviate on is the baby rocket ships taking off. Zod shows up. That's never happened before, right? Confronts Jor-El. Jor-El admits we've had a natural child, Zod. You know, he's very serious. He'll have its own choice. Yeah, he will choose. Imagine if a child can choose what be whatever he wants to be. And, nah. and the other dude just uh, like, bring it down. Bring the ship down. But not before he does something that is completely outside of canon. He fucking kills Jor-El. Yeah. Spoilers again. You shouldn't be listening this far. He knifes jor and kills jor but Don't worry, because he comes back and spends another two hours in the film, so it doesn't really matter. So that death is meaningless. He he is meaningless. He gets his son off. That's important. But he kills. He gets his son. That's disgusting, Kevin. Ew. And then Zod. And then Zod feels bad about it later. Remember, yeah. he's just like, I wish I hadn't done it to this but day. But I'm coded that, that way. I have to be that. I like that. Give At me least the Kotex. Give me your Kotex maxi pads that you're carrying in your blood. The whole movie is looking for this big fat maxi pad because. 
Yeah, it's called the Codex. That's the the it's the you know the kind of MacGuffin crux of the flick. Before the baby shoots off, Jorel in one of the many fucking action sequences he has when he busts loose from the guards, he dives into the Kryptonian gene pool thing where they yeah, you know the grow Genesis all the chamber. kids. The Genesis chamber where it looks like the Matrix underwater. Yeah. Little pods with all Kryptonians that are all genetically coded. Again, they don't have natural childbirth. So he crosses this place you're not supposed to cross, and he goes in and pulls out this thing called the Codex, which looks like. I guess the skull of the first Kryptonian. The original Kryptonian they never I'm say guessing, it, yeah. but it's got all this etching in it and shit. And from it, all the DNA is pulled, and and they can, you know, shape the DNA to be what they want. Right. And blah blah blah. They can genetically design the the cast. So the, he the does this and, and takes off with it and fucking uh, goes to um to, uh, back to the ship, the baby ship, and puts the codex. Uh, and they explain it later on. And again, way spoilers. It just goes into Superman's bloodstream. So he becomes the holder of all Kryptonian DNA, future genetics, blah, blah, blah. It's in this, you know, natural born kid. So Zod shows up looking for this codex. And, you know, Jor-El's like, uh, it's in the, sh- you know, f- I mean, you can't get to it. It's in the ship. And he fucking stabs him. Zod stabs and kills Jor-El. And that's fucking so different than anything they've ever done before. Because jor supposed to be standing there with his wife while the planet blows up and right. shit. But the planet ain't going to blow up. That's the other thing. Rocket takes off. You don't get that image of the rocket taking off and a planet exploding behind it and stuff. It takes off and then seems like months later. Like the moment the baby rocket is gone, they're trying to bring it down. Suddenly the cops show up and Zod is surrounded. And, and the, so the headpieces went. Yeah, the headpiece is like, we got our hats back on, you fucking prick. <laughs> <laughs> you Look at my hat. Down. Look how important I am. You better kneel before us, Zod. <laughs> Nobody ever says that. No. Nobody ever says kneel before Zod. You can't. I, I didn't expect that. I didn't think they would do that. I thought so, man. Really? Yeah, really? I thought there'd be a sex scene where he's like, kneel before Zod. <laughs> Why don't you go, wow, wow. Don't you Take kneel. your headpiece off. <laughs> he's like, it's too big. Speaking of headpieces. <laughs> it would take the whole movie. Um they uh, imprison the fucking uh, rebels, Zod, and turn him into space Fowler, dildos. Uh, 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 Didn't they have like giant dildos rising up into that ship? Instead of sticking him in a giant album cover mirror in space, as as they did in the Dick Donner version, they put him in these. Uh, yeah, essentially, as Ralph pointed out, they seal him in dildoant, <laughs> where yes. they're frozen. Uh, and then launched into space where they'll be frozen near the black hole through, through the Phantom Zone projector, I guess, or something. Yeah, I wasn't all quite time. sure how that all works. Yeah, I, don't know. I know how the Phantom Zone projector works. I don't but know how theirs works. works. But then what happens is Krypton eventually does fucking die, as jor predicted. Lara dies alone on it, you know, crying, watching it go up and stuff. Um, and it blows up. And when it blows up, the hold that it had on the prisoners just... You know, there's no command station on your planet. So the dildos melt. Yeah, and they're fucking the last Kryptonians. They're all trapped on this, like, fucking prison ship or whatever the fuck. So, uh, it, she, you know, they're, they, they've been roaming the universe looking for... He's genetically programmed to look for this fucking codex right. that jor stuck in with the baby. So he can't help but go looking for it. As opposed to, like, let's just start a world somewhere. They gotta find this fucking codex so they can repopulate Krypton, make more Kryptonians. Yeah. Even though it's, they should all bone the chick, they should all bone that Fiora. They don't fuck it anymore. Yeah, it's we'll dirty. They're learn. like sex is ugly. Yeah. They don't fuck on Krypton. They just look at each other longingly. Except Jor-El and Lara. Yeah. He was the only one who was man enough. He was like, "I'm going to take my Kryptonian cook and put it in you." Come on, Lara. <laughs> He's so serious. It's so, so badass. So when um they when they 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 only find Earth as Ralph pointed out before because fucking. Superman finds this ship that's hidden in the ice and turns on the homing beacon, turns it on and fucking all of a sudden it alerts Zod and his crew. And that's what brings them to earth. Yeah. So nice you're work, right. Cal, he didn't know that's not his fault. Still, who did, neither was his dad getting sucked up by a twister, but that set him all fucking to hobo land. <laughs> he just How does he get all hobo. hobo about this? He's just walking around, dude. He's figuring shit out. Humming some Burl jam. <laughs> That was the spoke in <laughs> class today. That was so I found that was the only thing that really took me out of the movie, man, because I was like, A, Superman list like a, a current song in a Superman movie, or not even current, it's a 20 year old song, but like I don't know. That felt to me the most incongruous. I don't know if it felt out of time, too late. I don't know. It's just weird. I I bumped into that where I was like, what is a Pearl Jam song doing in fucking 
Superman movie. I mean, it worked, but I, that for some reason that that hit me in a weird way. Yeah, I thought I was like watching singles for a second. Should have been singing Morrissey songs. The fucking emo hobo that he is. No, that's fucking the last one. This one he would be singing metal songs like "Man, man, 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 Zod is coming, coming in your face, man, 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 must defend the human race, man, man, man. Thank you, man, 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 man. So he, uh, when Zod shows up, I liked all that shit. I, I liked uh, the movie as a whole, but I liked the shit when they're on this Kryptonian ship with the giant window looking out over Earth. Like, that's fucking so sci fi. You mentioned it before, man. Like, they had less concerned with super heroics because they're like, how many different colors can you paint with those crayons? This time around, they're like, let's bring sci fi into it more. You know, like, let's, you know, it's less fucking capes and, and pantyhose and more about fucking space invasion and shit. Yeah. And that's a tried and true, you know, format that's worked before, as you mentioned with independence day, Roland Emmerich. So then it becomes this earth invasion movie and Zod announces his presence with authority, taking over all the TVs says, you know, I'm general Zod. You know, I've, I've traveled across an ocean of stars. You are not alone. Oh, it's badass, man. It's fucking dope. And, uh, you know, he wants Cal L cause Cal L's got the codex and shit. So he says, you know, release him or I'll fucking destroy the world or whatever, which is ultimately his plan anyway. Right. Which Superman's trying to figure out. He's like, do I turn myself over? Or, you know, if I do, there's no fucking... Then he might just fuck this world anyway and shit. And then Superman goes to sleep, has his badass dream where he encounters Zod. And somehow Zod gets into his head and, you know, he tells him his plan where he's just like, we're going to terraform this planet and build Krypton on the bones of humans. That's why I've seen that shot of him like sinking in skulls <clears throat> from one of the trailers or whatever. That's the dream sequence. It's pretty fucking bad. But Cal's also, luckily, they have an extra L suit on that old spaceship, too. That else. was left just for him. Yeah. It's yeah. A, bat- a battle suit. It's no longer a costume or something. It's a Kryptonian battle armor. It's like chain meal of sorts. Yeah. So they're but left. No one else wears it but him. Yeah. And it ha- luck- luckily, it has the House of L stamp on it because it's just the L suit. The so what you're right. So it was the it. L ship. Yeah, the idea behind these ships, we should point out, is Kryptonians sent off. You know, during, they do this really cool sequence where he's on the what becomes kind of the Fortress of Solitude, where Jor El's explaining the history of Krypton. And they do it in kind of like if you've ever been to the um, Radio City Music Hall or, or maybe the Thirty Rock, like that WPA style works project yeah. style of. Looks like Art Deco. Art Deco. Retro. Almost looks kind of like propaganda art, Russian propaganda art or something like yeah, that. Done with an etch sketch Yes. Like with a kind of a pin cushion. <laughs> like one, of those sketch. one of those desk toys you have <laughs> if, you're, if you're an executive. He tells the cartoon history of Krypton with this. It's kind of striking. It looks cool. But their technology is, yeah, it's essentially like pin art. Like you push your fingers into it and right. things move and stuff. But it's kind of, you know, they explain their sequence of how they at one point were so prosperous they launched, you know, fucking uh, their people into the stars and they would launch these outposts everywhere on all these planets and, you know, where basically Kryptonians could go and hang out and shit and then go to the next world or whatever. So, you know, all over the universe, I guess most of them died out or lost over time or died to the elements or killed each other or whatever. So there's this one outpost that I guess was buried on Earth, which, as Ralph points out, I hadn't thought about it until right now. I, here's why it didn't. Uh, well, no, uh, no, here we you're go. wrong. Yeah, uh. the suit is different. I, I was gonna say his key worked, but it wasn't necessarily the Superman one. But how do you explain the suit? You're right. Maybe the ship made the suit for him. Just happened to have the House of L sign on it. Maybe, maybe they they have a, a tailor. Maybe they have a robot tailor who makes you the suit. Whoever shows up there. I'm oh, you're it. an L. Maybe we'll make you one nice L suit. It is. It's one of those moments where you're like, "Look, I'm, I'm believing a guy can jump up into the air and and fly at his own speed, no gas pedal, stop himself, turn around, right. land yes. lightly, and shit like right. that." I'll buy. There's a suit a suit on the ship, and I would buy that he's a nice guy and not a hobo. And has <laughs> he's not more, a fucking hobo, dude. Has more optimistic. He drifted as much as fucking Dick Donaldson. No, he didn't, dude. He Dick didn't take Donner's- any jobs on the way. He just went right there. He Dick didn't Don- stop yeah. by and serve any Budweisers to truck drivers and trash the guy's truck or anything. He just went there. One would argue that. All right, think about it. The Dick Donner one. He's a teenager. He walks into the Fortress of Solitude. Next time he comes out in the suit, he is Christopher Reeve. He's a man. He's a man. So he's in there Superman. at least ten years or something like that if not more the way they represent him to who he becomes because chris reeve you would agree was like 33 when he played the part they always go for around the same age um 
So he was lost for a long time, just sitting in the fucking fortress learning, learning. shit. That's okay. right. He went to college, man. He well, my, my fucking Superman, a man of steel, went to the school of life, bitch. Oh, he didn't sit in the fucking fortress. He went no, out there and get did some shit. crabs, oh, saving yeah. lives, fishing. Yeah, let me fucking, serve you some beers. Yeah, yeah. helping his fellow man. He learned Singing humility to serve. So he learned being in bars how to deal with assholes and shit like yeah, that. I know. I was a bartender their, for many years. Put their trucks through telephone poles. That's I thought right. that was kind of cute. That was cute. Um, but there is where he kind of does his living, whereas the other guy lives in a fucking gilded cage, talking to his dead father, videotapes of his dead father. That's psychotic. At least this guy interacts with his dead father. Right. That's not psychotic at all. No, that's it's high tech. Healthy. <laughs> it's high tech. He's finding out answers to questions. And by the way, how long do you have to be exposed to our son before you get the superpowers? Because uh, Kal-El apparently had to live for about 10 years before he started seeing through shit and The little boy? Yeah. They only re- they, the way they represent it like 30 it. seconds. Boom. He's, he's got all the powers. He's good to go. Once he just his, landed. Once he lands. He, well, only when he's outside the suit, right? Or yeah. No? Right. But Cal was outside the sh- suit for the first 10 years of his life. It wasn't until he was starting to be 10, 11 years old he started to see shit and everything? Well, they represent in the movie that maybe he's... The way they do it, they represent that maybe it's happened before. Because when she comes in and he says, the world's too big, he doesn't say to her, oh my God, mom, I'm hearing all these things and seeing all these things. Like they represent it as if... It's an ongoing thing. Yes. With him. And her going, you know, but make it small. Hear my voice as an island. And Crypt doesn't even have a red sun in this one. It's got a weaker, it's got a weaker, older yellow sun like ours. And it's the, it's the new yellow sun that gives him all the powers. So why is the, why, why do that change? That's a good question, Kevin. But why not the red sun? I don't know. <laughs> why? I didn't hear that part. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they said like our sun is older and yellow. Older is, is older. Less yellow. The, 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 this is a new yellow sun and it's got more energy. So his cells will be bathed with the radiation of a newer sun. But it make, I mean, this even they show, you, they show you the Krypton. It's a, it's a regular sun. It's this not a sounds red so sun. stupid, but it makes more sense if it's a red sun, even though none of it makes yes. sense. Yes. But if it's a red sun, you're coming from one it's planet atmosphere. Different, complete kind of radiation. Yeah. But they also said it had more to do with the gravitational pull of the Earth. Like yeah, that was be part of it, too. Heavier on Earth. That's why when they. When Zod comes in and fucking terraforms, everything gets flattened and shit because they're the gravity creating, is becoming They're increasing heavier. the mass of the planet so it has more gravity, yeah. What happens is, you know, Zod says, turn over to fucking Man of Steel. Well, he doesn't say Man of Steel. Turn over to Kal-El or I'll destroy the planet. Kal-El tries to figure it out, has the dream, and then he's like, fuck it, I'll turn myself in. Yeah. So he turns himself in. That's the shot you see of him wearing handcuffs and shit. And he says he'll only talk to Lois Lane. And so Lois Lane, they bring her in. That's the shot you see of them sitting across from each other in the interrogation room and then somebody point there's a nice meme going around of henry cavill superman sitting at the interrogation room table and somebody took batman chris nolan batman put the from the side. joker scene from the dark knight scene and put him on the other side so you're like oh my god they're both at the interrogation it's table Justice League. and batman arrested superman <laughs> like it's, it's pretty sweet so uh once again we're in an interrogation room as we are in a lot of chris nolan movies and one guy talking to one other person and uh, he, you know, reveals that the cuffs mean nothing. He could see through the walls and shit and blah, blah, blah. He doesn't know who Zod is, but he'll fucking turn himself over to him and whatnot. He does so, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And that's when Zod's like, uh, not like, join us, Kal-El. Just yeah. like, we yeah. got to pull your codex. Breathe this shit. Yeah. Make you weak ass, motherfucker. That's right. There's no cri- He goes to Zod's ship. There's no kryptonite. Government turns him over. We should point out in this version, the government, everybody's fucking... Uh, suspicious and terrified of this fucking guy. Right. Um, he's no, you know, he, this alien, he could be bad for us. Meanwhile, there's an alien that shows up that's like, I am bad for you. Right. And if you don't give me this one, I'm going to be fucking triply bad for you. Yes. Meanwhile, the other guy. Hal never says that. He just yeah. says, I'm going to destroy your planet. Not at all. He's like, can anybody? I talk to a girl? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like most men. He's one of us. Superman. That's he's right. like, I want to talk to a lady, please. Um, so this guy, he uh, he turns himself over to fucking uh, Zod. He already knows who Zod is because his dad showed him the cartoons. <laughs> Luckily, we had 15 minutes of exposition from dead dad, so he knows everything he needs to know. Uh, the, they don't do kryptonite, but they do since they're all on a Kryptonian ship breathing Kryptonian atmosphere that they've somehow kept in the ship, whatever. It's all Kryptonian generated. Cal starts fucking getting sick and spitting up blood. So there's no kryptonite rock. I've seen some cats going, there's no kryptonite in the movie. Yeah, there is. He's breathing krypton. It's krypton. Yeah, right. It's kryptonite. That's his you know, the rocks will show up next when Lex Luthor shows up. You don't please, bring kryptonite please. into 
you got another Kryptonian to fight. He yeah. don't need kryptonite. I mean, obviously they worked it in there for the fucking enthusiasts like us, but you know they weakened him in a moment so they could beat the fuck out of him and draw bit. his blood. And draw his blood because that's what they're looking to put and recreate the Codex, the birthing Genesis chamber. They got one on this fucking ship of cows, the Fortress of Solitude, where his dad's hanging out, also has a, a Genesis chamber. Sure. So, you know, Zod could recreate fucking Krypton and he needs Superman's blood because that's where the Codex is hidden. They pull Superman's blood out and they're working on restarting it and shit. Superman has a choice later on to destroy the fucking Genesis chamber because if they birth a bunch of Kryptonians, they're definitely going to destroy Earth. They start with their fucking world engine terraformer flattening the gravity and shit so clearly they don't have the earth's best intention in, in mind uh as ralph points out there's a lot of damage and a lot of superman flying through buildings but one could argue that he's saving the whole fucking world you can't make an omelet that's fucking eggs. <laughs> breaking a few humans you know, along the way you never see it but oh it's there there's so much destruction there's of death. buildings you just gotta assume death. they're all empty like they were yeah. like we evacuate the next uh -huh, 20 blocks sure. of metropolis yeah, assume that you feel free whatever helps you sleep at night kevin <laughs> He on the ship finds out he's weakened. Lois is on the ship as well for some fucking odd reason. Because she's got a She comes ass. with him and shit. Because yeah, reporters are great alien ass kickers. And also, they and throw, tells her how to beat the Kryptonians. She meets his dad. That's yeah, right. Nice. They sit down. They have a meal. I love your son. My intentions are honorable. <laughs> she becomes Jor. part of the solution. At one point, she even says, "Like I know how to stop them." Like he gives her the information how to yeah. do it and stuff. Phantom Zone turned engines. Yeah, they, she knows they how to together. Yeah, man, man, which shit goes down. I was a little lost on a little bit. No, so, man, again, the Phantom Zone projector and the it's comics. also an engine. It's it's an engine and a Phantom it's Zone. It's their projector. nod to the. And I'm only getting lost. I'm sure if I'd never seen read comics. I would be fine with this, but I'm getting lost in Phantom Zone Projector is a fucking weapon that used to jail people. Right. And here, the Phantom Zone technology allows them to jump space. It allows them to, you know, essentially it's warp drive or something yeah. like that. So the idea is, you know, if you turn it on in the right way or the wrong way, it we'll becomes a black hole. Which I believe we've seen in a Star Trek movie or two or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, um, at, so that's eventually where they have to go to. Clark's on the ship. How does the fucking, I guess, oh, at one point, Jorel goes, I can control the atmospherics of this ship. But how does he upload? Cause she has the little magic Superman key. Right. There's, I can't even explain it. There's a little magic Superman key. She brings it with her. It goes into the ship. That's how Jorel uploads his consciousness to into Zod's ship. It. Right. And starts taking it down and stuff. And helps her but navigate. Then Zod knocks it out. He takes his, his intelligence out of it because he's got a super duper key that he puts in. And that takes Jor-El out of the consciousness. It's a good scene, ship. though, because it allows those dudes to talk again. Yeah. Can you feel his pain? You have his memories and his feelings. Can you feel his pain? It's awesome. He fights with him for a while. Until yeah. at one point he goes like, you know, he's like, I'm arguing for genocide with a ghost. You know, and shit like that. And then he realized, I'm not going to fucking talk to his computer anymore. And erases jor -El from what seems like. The mythology completely, the the movie. He's out. He never returns after that. Yeah, we'll see. Once he deletes that program. I thought about that. There's a back door for him to pop up in the next movie. But right now, spoilers, ain't no jor -El. But this is, of course, after he has that wonderful moment with... And this happens up there, I think, right after that. You know, Superman blows out the ship and fucking... Oh. The girl goes flying. It's Lois. Lois jumps into an escape pod, pod yeah. and as she's escaping, they're trying to blast her with some Kryptonian guns. And so her ship's going down. It's lighting on fire. She's screaming. This is the moment where he yeah, saves he her and she looks her over the shoulder. So she's in this screaming fucking fiery pod that's probably going to kill her. And then Superman, his last moment with Jor-El is like, you know, there she, you see her and he's like, you can save her. And he looks at his dad as you can save them all. Oh, that fucking, I teared up right there. I was like, go fucking save them all. Punch evil in its fucking face. That's why I can watch him punch out for 40 minutes because I'm like, beat the fuck out of him. He's going to kill us all, dude. Yeah. I want this to hurt. I want it to go on. Yes, some buildings are getting broken. I'm not in any of them, so I'm okay with this. It's a movie. But I wanted to see some, you know, I like that. That's the that's what I like. When I go to, I know it's totally adolescent, but when I go to a fucking superhero movie, I want to see a good guy beat the fuck out of a bad guy. Punch him in his face, her in her face, whoever the fuck. So now, all the punches, all the punches don't really seem to bother Zod, but apparently you can turn his neck too far. That's what we're <laughs> that's, Kryptonians have a very weak third <laughs> cervical I think it's the uh, I forget what what number it is. I think it's the third. Clavicle it's, where it's like it's very weak, and apparently if you just turn his head too far, then it's all it's lights out. Then it's no more problems. <laughs> we got bad weak backs. <laughs> they had no chiropractors on crypto. No, we have a lot of going for us. You can punch us for twenty minutes, but if you turn our heads too far, we will die. He goes down. He's, he saves Lois from certain doom, and then there's the showdown in Smallville. 
when's that Smallville showdown happen? Uh, before all that. About hour four of the film, I think. But there's the fourth a, hour of the film <laughs> is when four. that starts. There's a nice little Smallville showdown where a lot of the movie takes place in Smallville, not even Metropolis. No, it's a lot of like, destruction again, in Smallville. Spoilers. They destroy Smallville first, and then they destroy Metropolis. Later on. Yeah. Both places where he's from, which yeah. makes sense. Like, you know, if you're going to go after something that he really cares about, the place where he grew up, and... And the place where the girl he likes lives. I guess he has no emotional tie to Metropolis prior to this. This is what dials him in. Like as a storyteller, I'm sitting there going, all right, so out of this, you get the reason why this city loves him so much and the reason why he loves the city so much. More so than like, I'm a farm boy who's off to Metropolis, the big city. Like why that city as opposed to Hong Kong? Or you got to explain why he's not this citizen of the world who's going to live in every city why he picks just this one city metropolis he's american motherfucker no, that's he's why. not he anymore is. he don't not i was raised in comics. kansas i can't get more american than this he, he say says that. it out loud he does well he gets to have it both ways he loves america god damn it just because you hate america kevin smith i, I won't america. sit here and hear you cast aspersions on my country i love america but i gotta Tommy justify uh, how you keep a character that belongs to the world who protects us all on American soil. Because he likes us a little bit better. No, you can't say he, that. He likes America. I you said just, it. We've just lost loud. a billion Chinese because you fucking said that. You can't say that. He's got to love everyone fucking equally. Now, now, in the day that he was created, absolutely, America first. We were in the middle of a fucking world war. Of course, it was all about like, God damn it, America. This is America's superhero and shit. But it's not like that anymore. There are no more... We're not even warring with other countries as much as like corporations, you know, run most of the world. This is this is our Superman. When LexCorp comes in the next one, oh, we'll get dude, I cannot fucking wait. Like, and here's my let's save it. Put a pin in this. I know we got to wrap it up because it's Father's Day. Yeah, I got shit I gotta to run. do. I got shit to do. Um, but taking you through the rest, Smallville, they have a showdown, like an almost an old Westy showdown in the middle of town with people closing doors and them walking at each other, and yep. they have a fucking fight and shit. Decimate Smallville. He fucking threaten, be, threatens fucking his mom, and he takes him through fucking buildings, as we said before, some silos and through a Seven Eleven and whatnot. They decimate Smallville, and then later on they fight again in in Metropolis. Uh, they what the Zod decides to do is change the atmosphere. He puts a world engine. He calls it on one side of the world. The other side is Metropolis for some reason. Yeah, and that's gonna create. Are, you know, deeper gravity, weight of the earth. Create the mass, of the, the mass earth, of the change earth, change the atmosphere. And that's why all these buildings are like, you see all these cars go up, then slam down into pancakes and shit. So presumably that's happening. Everybody's being crushed by gravity. You see a gravity wave at one point coming toward the trapped Jenny, uh, what is her name? Jim, Jenny Olsen in replacing Jimmy Olsen, boy photographer. Um, with Perry White, who is now Perry Black, played by Lawrence Fishburne, right. trying to rescue her out of the 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 um, rubble, the rubble and whatnot. They they turn and look at like a wave of it's increasing, it's increasing like gravity, it's getting almost to the point where like we're fucked. Like yeah. at one point they Goodbye. give up struggling, going, yeah. "This is it." And of course, Superman is fighting the world engine on the other side of the world, I believe. And, and it's like a giant spider, as we mentioned earlier, and it's got these claws that come out and tentacles that wrap around him. And it's classic and it flies up of through, supers. flies up through the energy beam, through <clears throat> the center of it and, and destroys like it. Like in the Incredibles. Yes. Um, and then boom, the thing goes away. And so the gravity wave stops on the other side. And then at the same time, Lois has uploaded the, the fucking... The military drops his ship on them and... It's a phantom zone projector hole. that creates a black hole. There's a... Chris Maloney plays a military agent who first is like, I don't like this fucking Superman. When they announced that they cast him, I thought he was going to be Lex Luthor. I and I'd be too. like, that'd be badass. But he's a general, army general. who's like, I don't trust this alien. And then later on, he's like, this alien has my respect. He's not our enemy. This Truly, one. he was the king of the Jews. In that this very... guy saved me from that mean <laughs> bitch Kryptonian woman who was going to stab me. So now I like him. She doesn't have as much. They don't give her as much to do as no, the Kryptonian Ursa. Ursa. You know, But they did have a nun. You know, so when she's walking down the street. It's like her, Fiona or Fiora, whatever Fiora, her name yeah. is. She's Ursa. And then they have this giant lumbering non type character. Yes. Next behind her, her. yeah, yeah I saw like that. very similar to those. Who characters. Superman fights for at one point? He's he beating the shit out of him. Man. Superman gets the punch though. That's the I'm thing. all for punching. Punch the fuck out of him, and it's fun. forty minutes. I know there's a lot of punching. How about some punching and then no punching for a while? I'm talking, and then some more punching, and then some talking, and then more punching, and then talking. But they did that. There were moments uh, where there the were end, people talking. They were just punching. No, at the end, it was just punching. It was over and over again. There was a lot of fucking punching. But uh, you know, I would argue that. That's it what, was a video game. The last half an hour is a video game. You hit the nail on the head. That's what it looked like to me. Just constant. It was like playing Justice. What's that 
the uh, video ooh, game you were hawking. Plug. Yeah, what's that one you were hawking? Injustice, Injustice Gods yeah. Amongst yeah. Us. It was just Excellent that, game. that, 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 that. Which With you the control. CGI and everything else. It looked like a video game. It was like, okay. Some no. of the, we should talk about the CG in the movie. Some of it is really good. Some of it is, 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 is you know, it, it runs the little, gamut. Little, Some of it is little, impeccable. Some of it is a little, little video game. Cartoony, gaming. yeah. Um, but I, in wrapping up, man, again, we got to go. It's Father's Day. But in wrap, because we could go for hours. Um, I I enjoy the fuck of it. I think it starts the franchise. I you know definitely with Ralph on some places where it's like, I wish they had done the things I wanted to do. But for what they did, it did exactly what it needed to do. Kept made people excited about Superman again. Paved the road for a fucking Justice League movie. Superman's back. He's no longer like oh, yeah, it didn't work out, did it, and stuff like that. Found a way to crack the code for the 21st century. It looks like he's gonna do killer business. Probably wind up doing a billion bucks. Um. So I'm I'm happy. I was on the edge of my seat. I I was yeah, it, it punches a shit ton in the last 30 40 minutes or whatever. But coming from the Superman movie where he punched nothing, I feel like I can't bitch. I'm like, well, I sat in the other one I was like, I wish he would punch something. How and all he does is punch his movie. She's like, you I'm Lois Lane. He's like, you son movie. of a bitch. He rocks her in the face. <laughs> Put his fist goes on the back of her head. They're like, you're, you're from another planet, he son. He's how like, can fuck you, you, dad! Punches him in the face. <laughs> how can you complain about this movie after Superman Returns? And I said, because other good movies exist. It's not one or the other. There are other films that have done it more successfully. I thought this film was fine, but I think it was a missed opportunity in a lot of levels to really honor the character's true nature and also update it for a new generation. I think there were missed opportunities, but all in all, it's okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hate the film i just thought it was it was okay but and most, i'm hoping the second one will be more i think it'll kick some more major superman ass. versus lex luther more of an intellectual yes. emotional sort of battle and less spaceships and buildings dude think about it the lex luther stage is now set because you've watched aliens come into your world right. and destroy your city now luther can be the champion of humanity and say this guy is a pox among us and must yes. be getting and he of. can run the whole fucking land and just be like real fucking like this alien all fucking yeah, all racist condescending and, and racist about him yeah. that's the Lex Luthor publicly he's just like we have to be safe we have to protect ourselves I'm the first son of, of, of Metropolis and blah 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 but inside he's just who the fuck does this dirty fucking filthy thing think he is like the fucking people like immigrants like Superman's the ultimate immigrant story right, right. he's got a face you know to fucking cop or whatever the fuck if you look at the old movies who's here is just like you're gonna do it my way because I'm Fucking from here, uh, and that's I'm white, where, and this is America, yes. and I'm rich, and Lex I tell Luthor you, Lex Luthor is it. the ultimate fucking corporate white He's man, Donald evil Trump. Woman. Yes, <laughs> yes, with a, a, a Susan of Hitler or a lot of Hitler <laughs> thrown in. So who? That's my big question, man. Who is that? Who mm. will play Lex Luthor? Here's my guess, and here's my vote: Bruce Willis. And I don't just say that because I'm like I know how evil he can be. He's he's got clearly he's already bald, that, but that's not it. He could be charming. And insanely malevolent at the same time. And you think, who's got to play that part? They need someone they need fucking star. huge yeah. for Luthor. It's got to be a star. I'm not saying he's, he's still one of the, arguably one of the biggest box office stars in the world. Fucking the last Die Hard movie. As much as people were like, I hated it. Open fucking huge. Did business. Why not him, dude? Why not go for fucking Willis? Yeah. I, I, and, and again, I say that as a dude who's like, I personal, have personal distaste for him and stuff. But I think he might be the excellent fucking choice. I would charming choose. like ladies would love him. That's what you need about Lex Luthor. He's a little blue well. collar for me though. Who Bruce? Bruce. Yeah. But that's where Lex Luthor came from. He yeah. fucking killed his parents to get where he got. Like he grew up poor and became the richest man in the world. Like he's all vanity and ego. Who the fuck is that if not Bruce Willis to play that part? I would champion Bruce Willis. I to would play Lex vote Luthor. for Daniel Day Lewis. No, he's yes. too good, man. No. He's like an actor's actor and shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what you want. Like Link. If the moment Daniel Day Lewis starts doing these superhero movies, just fucking pack it up. So they said about Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman was a classically trained British actor. And he Russell was, he was the best. But Russell Crowe was in an action like yeah, he's done a lot of Gladiator stuff. and Robin yeah. Hood. He's in a superhero movie to yeah. some degree. Um, Daniel Day Lewis, like that. That there will be blood, sort of malevolent, sort of uh, take no prisoners, businessman kind of thing. Him shaved bald, doing a, doing what he do. But he's got to be charming and sexy as well. And like Daniel Day Lewis, I'm not saying he's. I wouldn't fuck Daniel. Well, I wouldn't fuck Daniel Day Lewis. Now that I think about it, but he's never occurred to me as like, oh man, he uses like think about Daniel Day Lewis at his villainous best was probably Gangs of New York, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, and he, he didn't lose sexy. Yeah, he's more Bill Butcher. 
uh, you know, he had it. He he would be like, listen, this is what a, a, a metropolis citizen would sound like. Because I listened to recordings and built this. To, Bruce, you just need somebody who's going to come in and be like charmed. And you just want to watch Cavill punch Bruce Willis in the face. Oh my that's god, for two want. hours straight. <laughs> oh my god, that's my dream, Ralph. I looked at this movie and said, if Bruce Willis was Lex Luthor and Superman was punching him over and over again. Uh, fuck you. Take every dollar I have. Perfect film. I would, I would sit my kid down and just be like, I'm sorry, there'll be nothing to inherit because I'm going to spend all my money seeing this movie. You'll never see me again. I'm just going to sit in a cineplex and watch this. Never listen to the opinions of others, folks. Go uh, see for yourself. Yes. The Man and, of Steel and just is as a, a spectacle. It's a summer movie. Go see it. It is that. I will tell you, I will take nothing away from the, uh, the, the entertainment value of watching all that they do up on the big screen. It certainly has that going for it. Um, but you know, whatever your opinions are about the film, these are just ours and you don't need to tweet us about your opinion or, or argue with <laughs> you me took a little bit already, on the internet you? about my opinion one way or the other. Uh, it doesn't diminish your enjoyment of the film at all because I didn't enjoy it as much as you. So just let that be in your head and know that and don't feel obligated to contact me or tweet me or, 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 or have an argument with me on any after on any that, level to after Twitter last, or Facebook or anything else after the Dark Knight pod yes after that people that was, like who the fuck do you think you are to argue yeah. with Chris Nolan yeah I mean again these are opinions yeah. and he says he likes the movie just yeah. was hoping for a little more and stuff it was but okay he's not like, it was oh, okay it seems like you like Dark Knight less, but I you did. probably had higher expectations because it's Batman. You like that character more. And I, I thought the second film was genius. Yeah. So I thought following that, I'd get more of the same. So I was much more disappointed with uh, Dark Knight than I was with uh, Superman. I thought it was it was okay. Go be part of the magic. Superman's back. If you love these movies, go see it in a fucking theater. You can see it IMAX. I chose 2D, man. I, I did thought too. it looked great. I did 2D. Um, but Superman's back, and we're one step closer to Justice League, man. And that means one day... A, ba- a movie with Batman and Superman in it and to Wonder bring us Woman. right back to Batman and Fat Man on Batman and Wonder Woman, uh, the entire fucking Justice League. It'll be fantastic. Anyway, uh, there it is, man. Two Batmaniacs talking about Superman, the new Superman, Man of Steel, man. Uh, I want to thank our special guest, the amazing uh, and hysterical and very fucking opinionated <laughs> when it comes to this shit. Uh, Ralph Garman, thanks for being here. Sir. My pleasure, and I want to thank uh, Kevin, who is uh, a future hobo, too, for <laughs> having me here today. Well, I can look forward to you uh, working on a fisherman ship. So and, I like and... this Superman. He looks like a weed smoker. He's yeah. like, how am I going to shave? He's an that? underachiever. <laughs> He's a slacker Superman. He is. It's like, I'll get there, man. <laughs> Fights with his father, just like a slacker. I'll suit on eventually. Don't <laughs> rush me. Um, there it is, man. For uh, Thanks for hanging out with us here on Fat Man on Batman. Come... Uh, Next week, man, when we'll uh, we'll talk about uh, the Batman again. We'll be back on track. Won't be any more. It's the Superman silliness. Oh, right back to the Batcave. Same bat time. Same bat channel. Smodcast.com.